By now, the world has become used to belligerent boasts and claims from Vladimir Putin, but in January 2024, he issued what may have been his most provocative edict yet, one with implications that go far beyond his already aggressive foreign policy. Here's a question. Does Putin really believe that Russia still has a claim to Alaska? What might we expect from him toward America's most remote state? Let's find out. On the 18th of January, Putin signed a decree which sets aside money to search, register, and legally protect Russian property outside the borders of the Russian Federation. The stated purpose was to allocate funds for the process of searching the real estate property owned by the Russian Federation, the former Russian Empire, and the former USSR. Once found, there would be due registration of property rights and legal protection of this property. The territories subject to such legislation and legal protection were not named directly, but the Russian Empire and its successor state, the Soviet Union, at times included large parts of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the American state of Alaska, and even isolated parts of the West Coast in the continental United States. Contrary to rumors that spread online in the aftermath of January 18th, the decree did not declare the Russian sale of Alaska in 1867 to be illegal. However, it was the latest instance of revanchist saber-rattling coming from Russian power centers. Some prominent Russian military bloggers, like the Two Majors Telegram channel, which has over 530,000 subscribers, were eager to see the decree be used as a basis for a new round of territorial disputes. Although their viewpoint has some influence, the military bloggers are not part of Russia's government, so we cannot take their posts as an indication of official policy. To see Putin's potential view on starting a territorial dispute over Alaska, we should first look at the history of Russia in the area, because Russia's record of territorial and cultural expansion is important in informing his view about his country's place in the world. Beginning in the 16th century, under Ivan the Terrible, Russia expanded in all directions at a rapid pace, and by the early 18th century, it was reaching the edges of the Eurasian landmass. In 1725, Peter the Great, victorious over Sweden in the Great Northern War, became interested in exploring the Northern Pacific and finding potential colonies there. He enlisted the services of the Danish navigator Vitus Bering in his enterprise. The strait between Asia and North America is now named in his honor. The first attempt in 1725 failed to reach North America, but Bering's second attempt in the 1740s succeeded. Although remote, the area was abundant in resources, especially the thick furs, which were also common in Siberia. Russia had long established its fur trade as a source of national wealth. Along this supply chain, Russian authorities would exploit the tribes of Siberia, exacting a tribute in furs at the trading posts it built in these vast open lands. The Tsars would then sell these furs in Europe at an enormous profit. Alaska strengthened Russia's fur trade in Europe and opened new markets too, after Russia established a presence in Alaska, adventurous frontiersmen and traders ranged through its territory, selling otter pelts to the Chinese. Catherine the Great created Russia's first formal Alaskan colony in 1784 at Three Saints Bay on Kodiak Island. Its governor was one of Russia's most successful fur traders, Grigory Shelikov. An Orthodox mission was established there too. Russian explorers went further south in the early 19th century. They even reached California, where they established Fort Ross in 1812. However, the colony, governed by the Russian-American company that Shelikov founded, was impossibly remote from the Russian heartland for it to attract many settlers. Sea otter populations also declined from overhunting, to the point of becoming extinct in certain areas. Populations have still not recovered today, and the otter remains listed as an endangered species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Worst of all, the situation in Eurasia was changing. Russia had entered a period of strategic competition with the British Empire in Central Asia as part of its quest for a warm water port. It also lost the Crimean War to Britain, France, and Sardinia, which came to the aid of the struggling Ottoman Empire. Facing such pressures, Russia decided that it could no longer hold Alaska, whose profitability was declining anyway. It did not want to see the British Empire gain the territory, which should have been easy for it to do based on its holdings in Canada. Worse, Britain extending its North American holdings to Alaska would put it on Russia's Eurasian doorstep. As early as 1859, Russia offered to sell Alaska to the United States, but the country was in the midst of a national crisis that led to a civil war, which delayed the proceedings. Once the conflict had ended and reconstruction in the South began, Washington was finally in position to make the purchase. Russia sold Alaska to the United States in 1867 for $7 million, or about $119 million in 2023 dollars, a price negotiated by then-Secretary of State William Seward. 
The sale satisfied Russia's interests, as it provided a buffer and set the United States up as a counterbalance against Britain in the Northern Pacific. The reaction in America was to call the Alaskan purchase Seward's folly, but for the United States, the move was also useful to its own interests. It expelled Russia from North America and contained Britain in the Western Hemisphere, which it had long claimed preeminence over with the Monroe Doctrine. A gold rush in the closing years of the 19th century increased its population. Alaska became a formal territory of the United States in 1912 and the 49th state in 1959. The purchase and later statehood of Alaska meant that the United States and Russia share a maritime border. At its narrowest point between Cape Dejnev and the Chukchi Peninsula in Asia and Cape Prince of Wales in North America, the Bering Strait is only 51 miles wide. The distance between Russia and American territory is much narrower at the Diomede Islands. The Russian Big Diomede Island is only 2.4 miles to the west of the American Little Diomede Island. In the accepted view of international relations, the sale ended any Russian claim to Alaska. It had willingly given up the territory and both countries agreed on the present border. Putin, however, does not view the world in terms of defined nation-states entitled to sovereignty and territorial integrity within a strictly defined set of borders. These post-Westphalia and post-Versailles conceptions of the state are things which he believes to be expressions of a historical Western liberal universalism. He instead views the world as one of multiple civilizations or civilization-states. This conception of statehood is one where the formal mechanisms of government power are primarily tasked with protecting a specific culture and its traditions. In whatever territory such culture and traditions are dominant, culture rather than politics or borders lies at the heart of statehood under his theory. Putin is not alone in this belief system. Xi Jinping, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan are all believers in this idea. Even Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been called a proponent of the civilization state viewpoint. The recognized national borders of the present do not matter as much in the civilization state conception of the world. What matters, according to this belief, is the presence of a cultural tradition. This is part of the reason why Putin considered Ukraine to not be a real state, but rather a fictional construction of the West's post-Cold War international order based on the Westphalian and Versailles system. To him, Ukraine is an extension of Russian civilization, especially because of the time Ukraine spent under the governorship of Russian authorities and the large presence of ethnic Russians and Russian-speaking people within its borders. To see whether he thinks the same way about Alaska, we will need to look at Putin and other Russian leaders' past comments. In 2014, during an annual Q&A session with Russian citizens, a woman named Faina Ivanovna asked him whether he would ponder trying to get the territory back, saying that it was something Russians would be very happy to see happen. Putin in turn asked her why she needed Alaska. He said that the American purchase of the territory was inexpensive and that people should not get worked up about it. However, the tone began to change after the invasion of Ukraine. In July 2022, Vyacheslav Volodin, chairman of Russia's State Duma, said that Russia could lay claim to Alaska in response to American lawmakers' attempts to appropriate Russia's overseas assets. He was not the only member of the Duma to make such comments. In March 2022, Oleg Mavetchev said that Russia should start thinking about reparations for the damage done by the sanctions and the war itself. Part of these reparations could include the return of all Russian properties, those of the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, and current Russia, which has been seized in the United States, and so on. He even included the territory of Fort Ross and Antarctica, which he said belonged to Russia, because Russia discovered it. This language anticipated what would come in the January 2024 decree. In response to Mavetchev, Alaska's governor Mike Dunleavy wished him luck, saying that there were hundreds of thousands of armed people in the state that would see it differently. In December 2023, another Russian lawmaker dropped hints that Alaska would be on Moscow's agenda. On X, a Duma member named Sergei Mironov suggested that American power around the world was waning and that Mexico should reconsider taking back territories it had lost to the United States in the Mexican-American War of 1846-48. Meanwhile, he said, Americans should think about their future and about Alaska. Under the civilization state theory, Russian claims to Alaska would come from its previous colonization there and the presence of ethnic Russians within the American state. Although the colony never had a high population, Russian culture and traditions survive from that time. For example, many of the communities in Alaska today trace their names from Russian sources, including Unalaska, the largest town in the Aleutian Islands. Kodiak Island still has recognizably Russian architecture and traditions. Russian cuisine is common in Alaska, as are Russian last names. 
There are also more recent Russian arrivals to Alaska, such as those in the village of Nikolaevsk, which hosts about 200 ethnic Russians. This population originates with a group of arrivals in 1968, after a split from the Russian Orthodox Church. Their way of life is still recognizably Russian, although Americanization is slowly creeping in. The political connection between Russia and Alaska may have ended in 1867, but such a connection is of secondary importance to Putin and other Russian expansionists, who believe that cultural ties are at the heart of a civilization and its state. Russian territorial claims in Alaska would come primarily from these ties. In response to a new Russian edict, a spokesperson for the US State Department laughed and said that he's not getting it, Alaska, back. In response to the State Department's response, Dmitry Medvedev, the former president and prime minister of Russia, wrote on X that, We've been waiting for it, Alaska, to be returned any day. Now war is unavoidable. He accompanied the message with a laughing emoji, signaling that his message was a joke. The Institute for the Study of War was quick to point out that a claim to Alaska, if indeed the decree led to a territorial dispute, was not feasible, but that the reaction of the ultranationalist military bloggers like Two Majors is telling about how deeply entrenched revanchist sentiment is within some circles in Russia. Like Putin, these communities believe that the fall of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe that erased centuries of geopolitical gains for Russia. Russia's military bloggers have often been critical of the war in Ukraine, but because of the way the Kremlin has conducted the conflict rather than the invasion itself. For example, these voices have been critical of Putin's reluctance to issue an order for full national mobilization. These communities would likely support a territorial claim on Alaska, as two majors has already called for. For many reasons, a Russian military attack on Alaska is inconceivable, even without nuclear deterrence. A conventional attack would at a minimum require a complicated amphibious operation with full cooperation between the Russian Army, Navy and Air Force. Given Russia's problems in projecting power into its own backyard and its lack of a combined arms doctrine, this is an unlikely proposition. It would also be almost impossible for Russia to achieve surprise. The movement of necessary troops and equipment to the Russian Far East would be easy to spot with satellite surveillance. Even if this could be done, Russia would have to contend with the United States Navy and Air Force. An operation against Alaska is an absurd notion. But opening a territorial dispute over Alaska, however fictitious, could benefit the Kremlin in other ways. The Institute for the Study of War said that the Kremlin may use the protection of its claimed property in countries outside of its internationally recognized borders to forward soft power mechanisms in post-Soviet and neighboring states ultimately aimed at internal destabilization. In other words, the decree could be seen as something of a grey zone operation. Russia's strategic partner China has demonstrated the effectiveness of grey zone operations against Taiwan and in the South China Sea. In the South China Sea, grey zone operations have seen an expansion of Chinese military presence. This expansion has led to a series of fortified artificial islands that have increasingly constrained the activities of other countries and international shipping in these economically critical sea lanes. On the Taiwan front, grey zone operations like constant sorties have steadily worn Taiwanese defenders down in money, material and morale. It's not out of the question that Russia could take a page from the playbook of its strategic partner. In a grey zone operation, Russia would not attack Alaska, but it could use the January 18th decree as a basis for a constant series of low-level military maneuvers. These maneuvers would force the United States to divide its resources and attention, concentrating more of them in this remote area rather than in Eastern Europe. There is recent precedent for this. In August 2020, the Russian Navy conducted war games near Alaska. According to Russian sources, 50 ships and 40 aircraft participated in the maneuvers in the Bering Strait with a series of practice missile launches. These exercises included the use of Onyx cruise missiles being launched at a target in the Gulf of Anadir from the coast of the Chukchi Peninsula. At least one submarine also surfaced as part of this series of maneuvers. The commander-in-chief of the Russian Navy, Nikolai Yevmanov, said that these drills were the first of their kind in the Bering Sea and were part of Russia's efforts to expand its presence in the Arctic while protecting its resources there. The purpose of this exercise, he said, was for the Russian military to get used to the Arctic spaces as part of a build-up in forces to ensure the economic development of the region. The exercises saw an American response, with NORAD sending F-22 Raptors to intercept six Russian Tu-142 maritime patrol aircraft that stayed in the sky for roughly five hours and came within 50 nautical miles of Alaska. The intercept was the second time that summer. On June 10, 2020, two formations of F-22 Raptors intercepted two formations of Tu-95 Bear bombers. The first pair of Tu-95s was accompanied by two Su-35 fighters and an A-50 early warning and control aircraft. 
The second pair of Tu-95s also included an A-50 and got within 32 nautical miles of Alaska, although all of the Russian aircraft remained within international airspace. Another incident that strayed close to Alaska occurred in March. NORAD says that intercepts of Russian aircraft in the skies near Alaska are common, which only makes sense given the close proximity of American and Russian territory. However, Moscow has built up its military infrastructure in the sea, improving and expanding facilities in the Arctic region, including enhancements to runways and the stockpiling of additional air defenses. Such infrastructure could be used to launch a concerted campaign of grey zone operations, would allow for Russia to introduce chaos into American diplomacy and military planning. It would take attention from the State Department and force the Defense Department to put more of an emphasis in the region, as Russia gradually encroaches on it with repeat grey zone operations. There is also precedent for enemy operations against Alaska. The Japanese landed on the westernmost Aleutian Islands in 1942 and were only expelled after a campaign that lasted for a year. Russia need not stage a similar campaign on these remote outposts to catch the attention of Washington. Increased grey zone operations near North America would at least disrupt American strategy. The mere assertion of a legal mechanism in American territory can be considered a psychological grey zone operation, forcing policymakers in Washington to guess at how serious Russia is about it. More realistically, the January 18th edict is the latest expression of Putin's expansionist philosophy. To him, the dissolution of the Soviet Union meant the end of centuries of Russian gains in what he largely considers a tragedy for Russia and for the ethnic Russians who live in the post-Soviet states that were once part of the USSR or the Russian Empire. He has called the demise of the Soviet Union the end of historical Russia. On December 12, 2021, as he was amassing forces for his invasion of Ukraine, Putin hinted at the extent of his strategic ambitions. We turned into a completely different country after the fall of the Soviet Union, and what had been built up over 1,000 years was largely lost. He said that 25 million Russian people were now cut off from the motherland by being within the borders of the newly independent countries, a fact which he called a major humanitarian tragedy. Putin denied that he was planning on attacking Ukraine, but we saw what his word was worth two months later. Putin may lack the power to extend this worldview to the once imperial Russian holdings in North America, but the post-Soviet states in Europe and Asia do not have the benefit of being part of American territory. In the January 18th decree, we see further hints of how far he would be willing to go if given the opportunity. We should not be surprised if new, more aggressive legal edicts regarding the former Soviet and Russian imperial territory come out of the Kremlin in the near future. Perhaps Putin's view is that Russia can historically gain territory but never legitimately lose it. In illustrating this viewpoint, the two majors' telegram channels said after the edict, we suggest starting with Alaska. Two majors also said that the decree should include Dnieper Ukraine, Bessarabia, the Grand Duchy of Finland, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and the central states of Russian Turkestan, most of the Baltic provinces, and a significant part of Poland. Do you believe this is what Putin is also thinking? Will there be new edicts from Putin regarding territory that had once been under Russian jurisdiction? What Russian grey zone operations, if any, might we expect in Alaska in the near future? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. Located approximately 400 kilometers west of the Russian mainland, around 1,300 kilometers from Moscow, Kaliningrad is bordered to the north and south by Lithuania and Poland. Essentially, it's a Russian outpost, but one that's had a growing strategic significance due to its close proximity to a large number of major European cities. Kaliningrad also has the only port on the Baltic Sea that remains ice-free all year, making it the ideal home for the Russian Navy's Baltic Fleet. Originally founded in the 13th century, this historic oblast is home to nearly half a million people, but also serves as a key strategical element in Russia's anti-NATO strategy. Recently, however, as Putin struggles to maintain Russia's status as a global superpower, Kaliningrad has become as much of a headache for him as it's been an asset and could become a serious liability to his campaign of aggressive expansion in Ukraine and beyond. For one, Russia's military forces remain overextended as the war in Ukraine drags on, leaving Kaliningrad largely out from under Putin's thumb, which may be why we're hearing a clear call for dissension rising up among its separatist groups. Emboldened by the hardships of the war, the leaders of the Baltic Republican Party have been calling not only for independence from Russia, but also for Kaliningrad to align with the West and its allies against the Russian president. 
Since the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula in 2014, Moscow has enhanced both aerial and naval connections between the Russian mainland and Kaliningrad. Given Russia's current struggles in Ukraine, however, it seems unlikely that it will achieve its overall objective and isolate the Baltics. And as political pressures within Russia intensify, and external pressures build due to the fallout of the war in Ukraine, the possibility of Russia losing Kaliningrad altogether has grown increasingly likely. If this happens, it will undoubtedly alter not only Russia's future, but also the futures of Europe, America, and various other parts of the world. So what's happening? How is Russia losing control of Kaliningrad? And perhaps a more important question, what consequences will there be if it does? In this video, we're going to take a look at these questions, while also closely examining the events that led up to this pivotal moment in Kaliningrad's long history. To really understand what the impact of losing Kaliningrad would be, we must first understand the influence it's had on Russia's recent history. Rewinding back to the first months of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Putin found himself in desperate need of the Kaliningrad exclave. Rather quickly, what Putin thought would be a swift blitzkrieg all the way to Kyiv instead turned out to be something else entirely. As many of Russia's frontline troops ended up in hasty retreat from key regions such as Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Sumy. This grievous miscalculation left Russia wide open to the possibility of a devastating counteroffensive. So Putin turned to one of the most powerful weapons in his arsenal, the threat of nuclear retaliation. And what has helped make this weapon an even more credible deterrent? That's right, Kaliningrad. To get the ball rolling, as early as May 2022, as much of the Russian army fell into retreat, Putin initiated a series of provocative military exercises in Kaliningrad, with the intention of demonstrating that he could, hypothetically, launch nuclear warheads all across Europe. During the exercises, Russian troops practiced electronic launches of nuclear-capable Iskander mobile ballistic systems, the same systems being used against Ukraine. And for what ultimate purpose? Essentially, Putin wanted to make the point that as long as he controlled Kaliningrad, no NATO member state would be beyond his reach. What's interesting about these maneuvers, though, is that the primary goal of them may not have been to remind the West that Russia has nukes, but rather to remind them that Russia has Kaliningrad. It's hard to forget that Russia has the largest nuclear stockpile on the planet, but it's much easier to forget, or at least to underestimate, the strategic importance of this relatively unassuming Baltic Sea exclave. This, however, would be a mistake. And for one very good reason, the Sawalki Gap, which is, according to many military analysts, by far NATO's weakest point. But more on that later. For now, it's important to note that Kaliningrad was not always a part of Russia. It was founded in 1255 by the Teutonic Knights under the name Königsberg, on the site of the ancient old Prussian settlement of Twangste. From then up until World War II, Königsberg would serve as Germany's easternmost major city. But after Germany's surrender in July and August of 1945, as part of the Potsdam Conference, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, later replaced by Clement Attlee, and US President Harry Truman, effectively redrew Europe's borders. And in the end, Königsberg was handed over to the Soviet Union and renamed Kaliningrad in honor of Bolshevik revolutionary Mikhail Kalinin. Unsurprisingly, the region experienced a notable demographic shift as the German population was expelled and the Soviet citizens came flooding in. But as Europe has continued to evolve over the past 79 years, the Russian oblast has become increasingly isolated, and this isolation has only been exacerbated since the invasion of Ukraine. As neighboring countries close their borders, NATO expands its membership, and the Kremlin remains focused on waging war. So far, some 5,000 Kaliningrad residents have been mobilized to fight in Ukraine, with an estimated 450 being killed in action already. The authorities in Kaliningrad, however, rarely discuss casualties, focusing instead on its contributions to the war effort, which has included quadcopters, camouflage nets, and clothes. A significant portion of its 2024 budget will also be allocated to help finance the war. And in return, Moscow has been pouring money into Kaliningrad to help mitigate the impact of Western sanctions and bolster the exclave's vast military infrastructure. Moscow has also shown great interest in preparing Kaliningrad to operate independently, mostly via infrastructure projects that would reduce its dependence on neighboring countries just in case it becomes cut off from the Russian mainland. And bolstering Kaliningrad's autonomy is probably a good idea, given NATO's continued expansion that includes the accession of Finland and Sweden into the alliance. 
At this moment, as the NATO net surrounding Kaliningrad gets increasingly tighter, the Baltic Sea is beginning to look more like the NATO Sea. But what this really means for the isolated exclave is that it doesn't need any more problems with its neighbours. Wedged in between the NATO and EU member states of Poland and Lithuania, Kaliningrad relies heavily on its neighbours for food, but also remains dependent on mainland Russia for a number of other necessary goods, and every year millions of tonnes of Russian oil, coal and coke, a carbonaceous material used in the production of steel, are transported by rail through Lithuania. Over the past several years, however, the relationship between Lithuania and Russia has gotten increasingly rocky. For one thing, right around the time of Russia's massive Zapad 2017 military exercise, Lithuania built a new border fence, and for two, Lithuanian helicopters have been known to hover over the railway when Russian military trains are passing through, possibly conducting surveillance. Following Putin's invasion of Ukraine, though, things have gone from bad to worse. Due to EU sanctions, nearly half of all the goods that would normally pass through Lithuania, in or out of Kaliningrad, including coal, metal, construction materials, and various modern technologies, are now banned from entering any EU territory. And even before these rail sanctions, there was the implementation of the EU's flight ban, which forced Lithuania to close its airspace to flights from Russia to Kaliningrad, forcing commercial carriers to use a longer route that took them out over the Baltic Sea. Unfortunately, the people most affected by these sanctions are the people of Kaliningrad. In response, Kaliningrad's governor, Anton Alikhanov, assured worried citizens that regular ferry services from St. Petersburg would help soften the blow. For their part, Russia's foreign ministry has accused Lithuania of violating international agreements that facilitate transit from mainland Russia, while the Kremlin denounced Lithuania's actions as a blockade against its citizens and threatened ambiguous consequences. In its defense, the Lithuanian foreign ministry said it was simply complying with EU sanctions and clarified that the transit of passengers and non-sanctioned goods to and from Kaliningrad through Lithuania would continue uninterrupted. But just to be on the safe side, Lithuania also ramped up its railway security measures and established a permanent helicopter presence over certain sections of track. However ruffled Putin's feathers might be though, he better be careful not to bite off more than he can chew. Lithuania has been a member of NATO for two decades, which means that any direct military action from Russia will invoke Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, obligating the entire alliance to come to its defense. During his 2022 State of the Union address, US President Joe Biden even pledged to defend all NATO territory, then expanded the US's troop presence in Lithuania by around 1,000 soldiers. Which brings us back to the Sawalki Gap. Stretching around 100 kilometers along the Lithuanian-Polish border, the gap separates Kaliningrad from the pro-Russian state of Belarus. So why is this a major concern for the West? Well, a fortified Russian presence along the gap would isolate Lithuania and Latvia from Poland and the rest of the EU. This is why a number of Western militaries believe that if war in Ukraine escalates into a full-on hot war with NATO, this corridor will be one of Russia's first targets. Because in the event of a conflict with Russia, the location of the Sawalki Gap would make it nearly impossible for NATO forces to reinforce the Baltic states. Russia could easily add heavy fortifications to this narrow strip of land, making it a potential death trap for NATO troops. Various wargame simulations have predicted catastrophic casualties if NATO forces attempt to pass through it. Putin's perceived willingness to sacrifice the lives of his troops would also give him a strategic advantage in using the Sawalki Gap to isolate the Baltic states and maintain his foothold in Kaliningrad. Hypothetically, Russia could sweep into the corridor simultaneously from east and west, cutting off Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia from the rest of NATO. But this move would also lead to an immediate confrontation between Moscow and NATO's many nuclear-armed members, which, if not de-escalated very carefully, could lead to an unprecedented catastrophe. If Putin does ultimately move against, let's say, Poland or Lithuania, it would certainly trigger NATO's mutual defense provision. But what NATO's actual response would be still remains unclear. For now, the Baltic's vulnerability to Russian aggression is central among NATO's many concerns. Exacerbated by Russia's actions in Ukraine, this has led to a shift in NATO's approach to security. And as they consider stationing more troops in the region to deter a potential assault, even skeptics now recognize the need for forward defense in Eastern Europe. 
The Sawalki Corridor's significance has taken the stage again recently, after Polish Prime Minister Matthias Morawiecki raised concerns about the Wagner PMC, or the Wagner Group, a volatile Russian mercenary group who is reportedly operating in the area. Intelligence reports have indicated that over 100 Wagner mercenaries have been deployed near the Sawalki Gap, in close proximity to Grodno in Belarus. Morawiecki's primary concern is that these mercenaries might be posing as Belarusian border guards or migrants as they try to infiltrate Polish territory in an attempt to further destabilize the region. Given how important Poland's military is to the region's defense, Putin might just try to exploit the historical tensions that exist between Poland and Lithuania surrounding the Sawalki Gap, a similar tactic he used in Donbass. The Wagner Group lost some of its credibility after a recent mutiny among its fighters, yet this also proved that the group was ready to employ brutal tactics to advance its mysterious political and military objectives. Supported by some influential Russian elites, the Wagner Group has attracted the attention of both the West and the Kremlin, which ultimately made a deal with them to end the mutiny. As a result, a significant number of Wagner fighters were relocated to Belarus. What's also concerning are the rumors that the Wagner Group played a role in the recent military coup in Niger, which ousted the country's pro-Western democratically elected government. Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin applauded the coup, and the new military leadership in Niger were quick to welcome the support. So, could the Wagner PMC act as a similar destabilizing force in Eastern Europe? That's certainly one of NATO's concerns at the moment. Putin's motive for enlisting these unruly mercenaries is likely not related to territorial expansion, but to probe NATO's resolve, using a series of strategically orchestrated moves. What can they do when the instigators are non-state actors, such as the Wagner Group? It's this ambiguity that gives Russia a buffer of plausible deniability. To stay ahead of this fiasco, NATO needs to rely on improved surveillance measures, enhanced intelligence sharing, and a unified approach to responding to such conflicts. Despite all the hype surrounding the Sawalki Gap, however, there are some who believe its importance has been overblown, that its perceived strategic significance stems from a misconception regarding its military value and potential vulnerability. For some, it's unclear just why Russia would need to physically close the gap or seize territory in the Baltic states to cut off potential NATO reinforcements. In a major military confrontation between Russia and NATO forces, geographical boundaries wouldn't really matter. Plus, the Sawalki Gap lacks natural features that would present any unique military challenges or opportunities. And besides, any aggressive action in the region would create significant political challenges for Moscow and likely lead to the invocation of Article 5, which Putin does not want. The military threat associated with the Sawalki Gap is also not one-sided. NATO forces could easily get the drop on Russian assets in the region, including those in Kaliningrad. In its efforts to secure the gap, Russia would also likely face a range of logistical challenges, similar to those they ran into during the invasion of Ukraine. If the gap's strategic value is taken too seriously, some analysts have warned the US and its NATO allies might be prompted to deploy a significant military presence to the region, which might only create other problems. Massed troops might just end up being prime targets for Russian long-range strikes, Putin would likely also interpret such a strong military presence as a potential threat, one capable of launching an attack on Kaliningrad or Belarus and perhaps provoking an exaggerated response. Heavily militarizing this region could also provoke other NATO countries to take action, ones that might have been previously hesitant to confront Russia, leading to further escalation of this already complex situation. This does not suggest that the region between Poland and Lithuania, which is an internationally recognized border between two NATO and EU member states, lacks strategic importance. But it might be a better idea to focus on the more vulnerable areas of NATO's eastern flank instead, the towns and communities in the Baltic countries, especially Latvia and Estonia that are nearest to the Russian border. Dispersal of military elements rather than concentration would create more opportunities for engagement with NATO military forces and likely be a better deterrent of Russian aggression. Another and perhaps bigger issue we should be concerned about right now is Russia's long-range missile capabilities, which do not depend on the Sawalki Gap to be effective. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in fact, Kaliningrad became crucial for Russia's defense strategy, which has consisted primarily of demonstrating its nuclear capabilities in the hope of deterring NATO intervention. Even if Putin has, in the past, been liberally threatening nuclear war, it's likely been more to influence public opinion and not as a serious threat of military action. History suggests that nuclear threats are rarely acted upon. 
Even in past conflicts such as the Korean War, not to mention the Cuban Missile Crisis, Russia didn't use nuclear weapons. Which is why most experienced world leaders, keeping in mind the low probability of actual nuclear retaliation, are unlikely to be swayed or provoked by mere nuclear saber-rattling. And perhaps Putin has been catching on to this notion as well, because as of late it's been Russia's more nationalist hardliners calling for nuclear action, while Putin has been content to sit back and present himself as a force for reason, although never actually taking the threat off the table. Some of Russia's hardliners have even argued that an atomic blast in Ukraine, in Europe, or maybe in a test over Siberia, will be the only way to reignite the fear of Russian aggression in the West. Former chairman of Russia's Federation Council, Sergei Mironov, who is now the leader of the A Just Russia Party, said recently that any attempt by the West to enter the Baltic region would be a real red line, or rather a red button, that Russia would be forced to press. Mironov seems to think that just because Russia is a nuclear power, that it would be justified in using its capability to defend its territory. And by its territory, he means every Russian region, regardless of whether the West recognize it as such or not. Mironov also went on to repeat the usual Kremlin rhetoric about invading Ukraine solely in retaliation to NATO actions and to rid the country of neo-Nazis. This scenario, however, has become somewhat typical in Moscow, with Russian hardliners spouting off about using or testing nuclear weapons, while Putin presents himself as the sole moderator, holding back the dogs of nuclear war. Rightfully suspicious of Putin's cool attitude, American and European officials have begun to speculate Several factors, they believe, have contributed to the Russian president's somewhat more rational approach to nuclear weapons. For one, he may still be recovering from the backlash from China, India and others who warned him there was no justification for using nuclear weapons. He might also be feeling more confident about his position in Ukraine. Either way, he still found the opportunity recently to casually mention that Moscow had successfully tested a terrifying new nuclear-powered cruise missile one with a global range that's part of Russia's expanding arsenal of strategic nuclear weapons. Putin has also warned that if Finland and Sweden join NATO, Russia would have no choice but to strengthen its defenses in the Baltic region, which would include the deployment of nuclear weapons. Lithuanian Defense Minister Arvidas Anusauskas, however, has long insisted that Russia has had nuclear weapons stored in Kaliningrad for some time. His claims have not been independently verified, but other reports have indicated that in recent years, Russia's nuclear weapons storage bunkers in Kaliningrad have been upgraded. Both Finland and Sweden have been official partners of NATO since 1994 and have made significant contributions to the alliance's missions. But on April 4, 2023, after Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan withdrew a series of objections, Finland became the newest NATO member, increasing the number of member states to 31 and paving the way for Sweden's application and impending acceptance into the Western Defense Alliance. The decision made by both of these Nordic nations to join NATO marks a significant shift from their historically neutral positions. But there's no secrets surrounding what ultimately inspired them. The invasion of Ukraine shattered the long-standing sense of stability in Northern Europe, which left both Sweden and Finland feeling increasingly vulnerable to potential threats. For many Finns, the war in Ukraine sparked haunting memories of the 1939 Soviet invasion, which resulted in the loss of significant territory and raised serious concerns about the security of Finland's border with Russia. Over the past decade, Sweden has also had to reassess its potential vulnerability. In 2013, Russian bomber planes simulated an attack on Stockholm. Then in 2014, there were reports of a Russian submarine lurking in Swedish waters. Then in 2018, there was the countrywide distribution of army pamphlets titled If Crisis or War Comes, which hinted to the growing concerns regarding national security within the Swedish government. While both nations have been rightfully worried about potential repercussions from Russia, it became clear that NATO membership was a necessary step to ensure their security in a rapidly evolving geopolitical landscape. Joining NATO will provide them with the same security guarantees under Article 5 as any other member. With Finland and Sweden deciding to join up, it seems that more and more of Putin's red lines keep getting crossed without retaliation. And as Western nations continue sending tanks and missile systems to Ukraine, not to mention training Ukrainian pilots to fly F-16s, President Biden and his NATO friends have seemingly begun to relax. 
To be clear, no one is saying that Putin absolutely won't resort to using nuclear weapons against Ukraine or its allies, especially if he starts to lose territory in Crimea, but as the war drags on, it seems less likely he will voluntarily kick off the apocalypse. Which is why, no matter how disastrous the war in Ukraine ends up, examining certain more realistic outcomes is helpful too. One issue of great future importance that has been widely debated among Western analysts is Russia's future ability to restore its military strength. For this matters, especially when we're looking at the future of the Baltic region, which will undoubtedly remain a crucial strategic junction for both Russia and NATO. For now, it seems that the substantial investment Moscow has made to modernize its military has been largely squandered, and that Russia's weakened economy likely won't be able to sustain any similar investment for many years. Whenever this war ends, it will also be imperative to restore the global framework for strategic, non-strategic nuclear arms control, to re-establish these agreements and standards that have been seriously eroded by the escalation of Russian nuclear rhetoric and blackmail will be especially vital for Moscow if it wants to be welcomed back to the international bargaining table. Certain members of Moscow's expert community, mainly risk-averse political elites and some senior military officials, have more and more begun to push back against reckless nuclear saber-rattling, recognizing the utter impracticality of nuclear warfare, especially given the state of Russia's armed forces. But still, Putin has adamantly rejected any proposal to reduce Russia's nuclear arsenal. So as it looks now, whoever comes after Putin will have the challenge of shifting the government away from a nuclear-centric, even nuclear-worshipping mindset. Putin's successor will also have to face the strategic reality that, if the war in Ukraine is still going, they will need to de-escalate tensions in the Nordic-Baltic region to avoid a potentially unwinnable arms race with NATO. But for now, Putin is still in charge and he seems perfectly content to rely on veiled nuclear threats to hopefully deter the West and possibly distract them from Kaliningrad's potential strategic importance. And this may work for a time, but time is what Putin seems to be running out of. As groups of increasingly vocal separatists continue to threaten Russia's hold on the Kaliningrad exclave, Ever since Kaliningrad became a Russian exclave, there have been whispers among native intellectuals about the possibility of one day achieving independence. For many years, there weren't any grassroots sectionist movements, but there was enough talk to spark fears of separatism in Moscow, fears that were largely fueled by objective factors like Kaliningrad's far-out geographical position, which makes it all that much more susceptible to foreign influence. After the Soviet Union collapsed and on through the 1990s, there were repeated public calls for Kaliningrad to become the Fourth Baltic Republic. But because of the oblast's importance, as home to Russia's Baltic fleet, which could no longer use ports in the Baltic countries, Moscow cracked down hard on that sentiment. But in the 21st century, as economic conditions have worsened, and the contrast between life in the exclave and life in Lithuania or Poland has increased, separatist sentiments are once again on the rise. As a result of this, the influence of Russia's state media also appears to be waning in the region. Despite Moscow's efforts to combat what it's called a growing enthusiasm for Germanization and creeping separatism, these efforts have included expelling German backed NGOs, launching campaigns against the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, and dismissing academics with ties to cultural organizations in Germany. And as information remains scarce due to Kremlin censorship, assessing the true extent of support for independence proves challenging, with many residents remaining cautious about openly advocating for secession. Perhaps the loudest voice at the moment, though, is that of the Baltic Republican Party, or BRP, which was founded in 1993 by Königsberg natives, also known as Baltic Russians. In an uncommon display of protest, just before the invasion of Ukraine, protests erupted outside the Russian embassy in Warsaw, as members of the BRP demanded demilitarization of the exclave. A year later, an unauthorized and potentially illegal online referendum took place in five Russian regions. Some 95,567 people participated, about 19.4% of the population, and all the regions that were polled voted in favor of independence. Much of the information we have comes from reporting outside Russia or reports made prior to the war in Ukraine, so it's possible that results simply reflect the bias towards pro-independence sentiment among the participants. But if anything, the referendum still served as a potential reminder that there are still those eager for independence. Perhaps encouraged by the vote, despite the Kremlin's efforts to stifle separatist movements through censorship and media restrictions, the BRP believes secession from Russia is only a matter of time. 
to make their point when referring to the exclave, the party uses the name Königsberg, the German name for the city before it was handed over to the Soviet Union after World War II, claiming that it rightfully belongs to Europe. Party membership, they also say, has been steadily increasing both within Königsberg and the region surrounding it. One day, one way or another, the war in Ukraine will come to an end. And when it does, the structure of the Russian Federation will almost certainly change. If Russia prevails, well, life in Kaliningrad will likely not improve, but there are also many other scenarios that could lead to greater autonomy and even full independence for the former German city. With that said, the Kremlin has no intention of losing any part of its empire and will therefore continue to crack down on separatism. Even with the support from its European neighbors, unless drastic post-war changes occur within Russian society, Kaliningrad's sovereignty may remain out of reach for some time to come. In the meantime, the desire to revitalize East Prussian culture and the goal of an independent Königsberg will persist, likely until the right time and conditions for making the first steps in this direction are met. Unfortunately, the future of the Kaliningrad exclave will largely depend on the outcome of the war in Ukraine. And when it ends, the stage will either be set for freedom or the dream may die forever. It couldn't hurt to ask, with all the changes happening in the Baltic region lately, what are the chances Russia simply loses interest in Kaliningrad? Some might even say that when Finland and Sweden officially join NATO, aligning themselves with Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, Kaliningrad shifted from a strategic asset for Russia to more of a burdensome liability. In a very short time, Russia's chances of creating a chokehold for NATO at the Sawalki Gap went from good to nearly impossible. And on top of that, NATO now has the ability to bypass the gap entirely, deploying troops from the north, across the sea, or via air routes, keeping their distance from Kaliningrad's missile batteries and anti-air defense systems. These developments have fundamentally transformed the strategic significance of Kaliningrad, so much so that the French Institute of International Relations recently declared that the accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO has largely upended Russian strategic planning and that its goal to exploit military superiority has been lost. The report also pointed out that during the first phase of its invasion of Ukraine, Russia redeployed its most combat-capable units including its Air Assault Division and Marine Brigade, to support its offensive operations there, while at the same time, all amphibious capabilities of the Baltic Fleet were dispatched to the Black Sea. Now these units are fully engaged in countering the Ukrainian counteroffensive, which has left Fortress Kaliningrad largely undefended. To Russia's credit, they have maintained unrestricted access to Belarus, but its current shortage of forces limits the benefit of this alliance, Lately, Russian and Belarusian forces have come together for a number of military exercises, including the Zapad 2021 exercises. But it's mostly been Russia's aerospace forces that are using Belarusian airbases for attack missions in Ukraine. Russian ground troops have, too, been consuming large amounts of ammunition from Belarus's pre-war arsenal. It's Putin's deployment of non-strategic nuclear warheads to Belarus, though, that could create the most trouble down the road. Complicating things for Belarus even further was the arrival of several thousand Wagner mercenaries after the failed mutiny in June 2023. Lacking any real sense of organization or heavy weapons, these guns for hire simply weren't capable of turning the tide in Ukraine or posing any real threat to Belarus's NATO member neighbors. But they did, as mentioned earlier, stir things up around the Sawalki Gap. But even though they make them a bit nervous, Poland is fully capable of addressing the Wagner threat. What's less clear is why Putin thought it would be a good strategy to relocate this unstable group of mercenaries just 25 kilometers from his base in Asivapichi, the supposed location of Russia's nuclear warheads. With everything that's happened, regardless of the outcome of the war in Ukraine, Russia has little chance of re-establishing its previous military authority in the Baltic theater, or even matching its regional forces with NATO's. Putin will probably continue to lean on trusted deterrent strategies like nuclear saber-rattling and so on hoping that the West will take into consideration all the urban targets that are within reach of his caliber and Iskander missiles. Or he may just go all the way and openly deploy nuclear weapons to Kaliningrad. But in the end, these will only be half measures, and won't do much to shift the reality of Russia's crumbling strategic position. Perhaps the best future we can hope for right now is a post-Putin leadership that's less inclined to seek out militarized confrontation with the West and instead look for opportunities to restore cooperation and stability to the Baltic region. But what do you think? Is Kaliningrad the key to dominating the Baltic region? What will happen if Russia manages to close the Sawalki Gap? 
Are all Putin's nuclear threats just noise, or is he actually capable of pressing the button? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. This is the biggest country on planet Earth, with a total area of 6,601,665 square miles and a land area of 6,322,142 square miles. It represents 11% of the total world's landmass and is 1.8 times larger than America. But Russia isn't just a big country, it's a big problem. And if it collapses as a result of the consequences of the war in Ukraine, this will impact everybody, everywhere. Yes, even you. But why? And in what way? Let's find out. Send in the tanks, uh, if you can find any. Russia has always prided itself on its Victory Day celebration, held to commemorate the Soviet victory over the Nazis in World War II. The bombastic parade held annually in Red Square has historically served as a visual barometer of Russian military power. It is common to see rows upon rows of marching soldiers, jets, tanks, armored vehicles, and intercontinental ballistic missiles file past an absorbed crowd and its approving leadership. This year, things were a little different. The Kremlin scaled things back, like, a lot. There was no flyover, there were no Iskanders, there were 3,000 fewer soldiers, most of them cadets and students at local military universities. And rather than a steady stream of T-90Ms, T-14 Armatas, a solitary World War II vintage T-34 tank motored past the reviewing stand. For how staggering Russian tank losses have been in the Ukraine thus far, it's tempting to think this T-34 is actually the bottom of the barrel for Putin's forces. After all, Having lost 192 tanks in the First Chechen War, 23 tanks in the Second Chechen War, and 3 tanks in the Russo-Georgian War, Russia has now lost an impressive 1,937 tanks in Ukraine thus far, as of May 2023. And that is just how many have been visually confirmed. Just let that sink in. There are more tanks yet in Russia's arsenal, but most of them are currently employed in Ukraine, along with the lion's share of its military forces explaining the humbler military parade presence than years past. Factor in the recent drone scare over the Kremlin, and we can see that this year's parade was held despite legitimate strategic red flags and security concerns unfathomable just one year ago. Some say the event, designed to capture the public's imagination and promote the heady militaristic nationalism of the Soviet glory days, is merely papering over the cracks in Russia's armed forces. Of these, there are many. The irony is that the last time the Russian military orchestrated a military victory of any consequence was exactly 78 years ago during World War II. Today, its operations in Ukraine are on track to follow a more common Russian pattern of strategic overstretch and ignominious withdrawal. There are increasing warning signs that the weaknesses we are seeing are evidence of far graver threats to Putin's regime. Recently, Yevgeny Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner mercenary group fighting around Bakhmut in Ukraine, criticized the Kremlin for not sending enough ammunition to make a difference on the front lines. Victory Day is the victory of our grandfathers, he vented on social media. We haven't earned that victory one millimeter. It should surprise no one that victory now looks far from attainable. On the contrary, in the light of economic sanctions and the declining financial health of the Russian Federation, some are predicting far worse for Putin's forces and his political future. With less to be positive about now than at any point in the war, could Putin's regime actually be on the brink of collapse? And what might that look like? In a recent survey of 167 foreign policy experts held by the Atlantic Council, 46% of them believed that the collapse or disintegration of Russia could happen in the next 10 years. 40% claimed that this would happen internally for a number of reasons, particularly because of a revolution, civil war, or political disintegration. We all know that wars gone awry can exacerbate and expedite the deterioration of a society faster than just about anything else. But Putin's abysmal strategic direction of Russia's war in Ukraine could have the country on the fast track to obscurity, oblivion, or far, far worse, outright dissolution. There are two prime historical touchpoints in modern history we tend to reference when we talk about a Russian political collapse, which is really saying something if you think about it. The first is the most recent, when the Soviet Union broke apart at the end of the Cold War. 
In case you're too young to remember, this collapse caught the world by surprise. Many were shocked to see a country so large and powerful, on paper at least, suddenly and rapidly fall apart. Some blame Russia's current state of affairs on the West's response to that significant geopolitical moment. Heralded as the start of a new era of freedom, liberation and self-determination, many worried the independence of a host of ex-Soviet satellites and the weakening of Russia would destabilize the international order. Since the 1990s, all of the Soviet Union's 21 constituent republics declared themselves sovereign. Putin, a staunch imperialist who pines for the good old days, took this pretty hard. After he rose to power, the West tried to maintain dialogue and positive relations with the Kremlin, even as it embarked on a repressive imperialist foreign policy with deployments in the Second Chechen War, the 2008 invasion of Georgia, and the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. Since the end of the Cold War, Putin has created a regime that actively restricts the rights of the dozens of different national and ethnic groups within the boundaries of the modern Russian state. He wants to be a czar, with a wheel of dependent satellites to exploit for natural resources, manpower and money. Russian officials and Kremlin propagandists have made it their goal to promote this agenda, making the ruthless look benign. Someday, who is to say Moldova, Kazakhstan or other Central Asian nations might not come under the tighter thumb of Russian imperial aggression. What would it mean for European security? That's why Ukraine matters. The war there poses serious problems for Putin's imperial ambitions. He and his cabinet thought it would be a short war, one that would permanently bring Ukraine back into Russia's orbit. Instead, he is suffering one of the most catastrophic military setbacks of the past hundred years one that has already surpassed the devastation caused by the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and one approaching the scale with the type of suffering that preceded the other major Russian collapse, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. That, in case you forgot, was the first time the Russian Federation dissolved, the event that triggered Russia's chaotic, bloody descent into Soviet-era communism. And let me tell you, it was a whirlwind of a time to be alive. One moment you are a Russian soldier, fighting Germany and Austro-Hungary with the Entente Allies on the Eastern Front. The next, you learn the inefficient and widely corrupt Tsarist government can no longer sustain the economic and material costs of the war effort. Before you know it, tens of thousands of soldiers, workers and peasants are fed up, rising up, overthrowing the imperial government and installing the Bolsheviks in power. Countless Russian minorities yearned in those turbulent times for some form of recognition and freedom which had been elusive under the Tsars. When the empire disintegrated and crashed out of the war, social, economic and socio-political ruptures terminated the central control of the state and enabled the temporary formation of a series of new polities including the Siberian Republic and other former territories that got their first taste of independence. These include Finland, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. It wouldn't be long before the Soviets, consolidating state power once more under the communist flag of the USSR, gobbled them back up. And you wonder why they were more than happy to join NATO in the aftermath of the Cold War? Most experts believe that a modern Russian collapse will be swifter, more brutal, and more akin to the revolutionary crisis of 1917 than the Soviet collapse of 1991. It is a possible scenario. The conditions in Russia today do bear a passing resemblance to those within the Tsarist Empire at the time of its fall. A deeply corrupt and morally bankrupt ruling class led by oligarchs, aristocrats, and elites with no conception of the economic suffering of the masses. Ethnic minorities in places like Dagestan, Ichkeria, Igushetia, Ossetia, Kabardino, the Caucasus, Tuva, Buryatia, and others inhumanely treated, discriminated against, and used as cannon fodder in Putin's wars. A population in serious demographic decline, growing mistrust of Russian institutions and governance, intensive state oppression, a country that will owe billions, if not trillions of dollars, to rebuild Ukraine when the time comes. If you think any singular cause will cause Putin's downfall, you'd be wrong. History is non-linear, multi-causal and contingent, Yanis Bagashki, author of Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, put it best. The demise of the current Russian Federation is unlikely to follow a single path, unlike that of the Soviet Union where 15 Union republics became independent states almost by default. The fracturing of the state is likely to be chaotic, prolonged, sequential, conflictive and increasingly violent. 
It can result in the full separation of some federal units and the amalgamation of others into new federal or confederal arrangements. Bruno Tertrace, an advisor for geopolitics at the Institute Montaigne, has argued that the only good thing about a Russian collapse today is that the nuclear issue would be far less serious than it was with the Soviet Union. Elites would be far more interested in preserving some semblance of authority and power rather than commit political and personal suicide by launching a nuclear attack. Most of Russia's nuclear forces today are inside the Federation, not beyond its borders like during the Cold War, when it had 7,000 nukes stationed outside Russia. Exploring the implications for Russia's future as a nuclear power if trends continue the way they are, Bruno observed, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union was described as upper Volta with rockets, he said. By the 2000s, it was Mexico with nuclear weapons. In 2010s, a gas station with nuclear weapons. Will it become a Somalia with nuclear weapons? So how exactly might Russia collapse? What would it mean for its neighbors? We know that a country's foreign policy is a reflection of its domestic situation, and vice versa. In Russia's case, Putin's actions have the country on the path to economic Armageddon. The price of Russian crude oil is the lowest it's been in years. Within the first two months of 2023, the state had already fallen into a deficit level normally achieved in an entire year. It isn't profiting much from its sale of hydrocarbons to India and China. Its import sales are collapsing. Its GDP has shrunk by 4%. Air cargo fell by 60% in 2022. There has been a massive loss of technical expertise and specialized equipment as foreign corporations and businesses fled the country. It lacks vital semiconductors and other specialized machinery imported from the West, meaning its entire economy, to say nothing of its military power, is becoming more and more primitive. The net result is an increasing reliance on states like China for resources and technology, systems that can be integrated but take time. While that happens, poverty will spread it will be harder to receive good health care, and the population will grow more discontent with the government. These factors could affect the strength of existing national movements or ethnic minorities within the Russian Federation seeking greater independence and autonomy. Moscow is far removed from many of these population centers and has, until now, relied on a technocratic system of oligarchical control where Kremlin-appointed elites receive massive checks to keep their provinces in line. These leaders, in turn, return the regional profits to the Kremlin's coffers. Russian elites are deeply dependent on Moscow's political and economic authority for their own legitimacy. When this goes bankrupt, what happens? When the public loses faith in these Kremlin-appointed governors and the Kremlin can no longer provide them with the support they need to maintain order, there's a chance that local separatist movements will grow. In resource and industrial-rich regions, there might be the temptation to cut ties with Moscow and go it alone with the support of the people. This happened in 2020, when mass protests erupted in eastern Khabarovsk after the arrest and 22-year imprisonment of Sergei Fergal, a member of the opposition party. This caused a power vacuum that Moscow had to fill. But it needs resources and support to do so. And with the war dragging on and the bite of sanctions becoming more and more acute, it is increasingly likely that Putin will struggle to plug the holes in the dike as the flood of discontent spreads. Unlike the Soviet Union, whose power rested on the Comintern and whose governing authority always had a reasonably clear line of succession, nobody knows what will happen in Putin's vertical, highly centralized hierarchy if the figurehead falls. Will there be a civil war? Will a power struggle ensue between Putin's elites? Will Moscow, already neck deep in its military invasion of Ukraine, have the resources to suppress any separatist movements that arise? Back in 1917, this was the avenue that led to the downfall of the Tsarist Empire. Like falling dominoes, the Ukrainian Central Rada presented its first universal declaration. Five months later, it declared the creation of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Other regions did the same. By the time you get to 1918, the Red Army was forced to suppress these movements and bring them into submission. Only Poland, Finland, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania States with active support from the United States, Great Britain and France, the victors of World War I, managed to secure their independence, if only for a time. The Bolsheviks managed to set the ship straight, but it came at a massive cost. Putin has to hope his cronies are as committed as the Bolsheviks were when his grasp on power is brought into question. 
So far, one of his tactics has been to feature minority participants in the Ukraine occupation like Kadyrov's Chechens in his propaganda campaign for two purposes, to both show Federation solidarity in the war and, if things go sour, to have a scapegoat for the Russian army's broader operational failures. If Russia collapsed, it would probably start with a breakaway movement in one territory that spreads like a virus to others on the country's periphery. Chechnya, for example, could be the first domino to fall. They have a history of enmity with the Kremlin, after all, and a recent one at that. Local elites like Kadyrov will be posturing for greater political power if they start to glimpse fractures in Putin's existing political system. Already struggling to deal with Ukraine, how might Russia deal with discontented Chechen and Wagner mercenaries who, more loyal to the cult of their own determined rulers than they are to Russia itself, come marching back to Moscow? Could these leaders, fueled by vengeful hatred for the way they were left to die on the battlefields of Ukraine with too few weapons, shells, and dilapidated equipment, form a Faustian pact and team up against Putin? Or will battlefield defeat and economic poverty force these sides into internecine warfare amongst themselves, a battle royale for ultimate political power? Okay, it might be a stretch, and we should temper our prognosis just a little. While it's tempting to look at online maps depicting the collapse of Russia by 2025, with fantastical graphics carving the country up into dozens of independent republics, the reality is that Russia's internal divisions are far less stark than they appear. According to Alexei Gusev, a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the maps betray a delusion on the part of their authors that is common to many political forecasters. These observers, all map fetishists, mistake the administrative boundaries of Russia's provinces for real borders of socio-economic life, unaware that the true divisions in Russian society almost never coincide with the arbitrary lines drawn by Communist Party functionaries in the first half of the last century. Russia is extremely unlikely to disintegrate along its regional borders for geographical, sociological, economical, and political administrative reasons. Sociologically, Gusev argues, most of Russia's regions share the same basic values and attitudes. For those praying for Putin's downfall, just know this. Russia always ends up rebuilding itself. Preferentially, a new, more egalitarian form of governance would emerge from the ashes. Historically, hardship, defeat, and political turmoil have been the breadbasket of totalitarianism. As long as Putin remains in power, it is unlikely that Russia's collapse will resemble the peaceful disintegration of 1991. Putin looks set to run, in air quotes, naturally for president again in 2024. He'll be familiar with essays by the likes of Ival Ilyin, who wrote in 1950 what dismemberment of Russia entails for the world. He knows that battlefield victories will all but seal his grip on power for decades to come. But with a hard year of campaigning ahead, one in which Ukraine will slowly integrate new Western weapon systems into its counter-offensive strategy, Putin will be forced to drain Russian resources further, sending young men to die on the front lines. Hatred will grow. Putin will be forced to suppress these feelings to prevent widespread discontent. This begins a vicious cycle in which the only thing that can save his dictatorship is more suppression, which leads to more discontent. And you see where this is going. Edward Lucas, senior advisor and senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, put it best. As the butcher's bill mounts in Ukraine, the war story contains only stale bombast. The lie machine insists that black is white. The result is cognitive dissonance between what Russians experience in their daily lives and what the state propaganda machine is telling them. As we know from Soviet times, that can last for a long time, but not indefinitely. The whiff of change is in the air. The truth, more than anything, is that the cracks in the Russian power pyramid have been present since Putin came to power. His actions over the past year have only accelerated a process of decline already long in motion. It is fighting an unwinnable war. If it refuses to pull out of Ukraine and rebuild its military, it will soon be unable to prevent those who want to leave the Federation from doing so. If the oligarchs turn on Putin, Will there be a struggle between intelligence services, the National Guard, and foreign mercenaries? Will Putin be assassinated? Russia has committed several grave geopolitical blunders throughout the past hundred years. Could this be their worst? Could Putin survive politically or physically a military defeat? Let us know in the comments.
The invasion of Ukraine by Russia in 2022 escalated a conflict that began with Putin's annexation of Crimea in 2014, transforming it into a full-blown war marked by substantial losses on both sides. The question of how many soldiers Russia has lost looms large. While Putin may present figures suggesting minimal losses, evidence from Ukraine and Western media paints a starkly different picture of Russian casualties. Yet the toll of this conflict extends beyond the battlefield casualties. Significant damage to equipment, weapons, and lost territories underscores the war's broader impact. What do these losses indicate about the current state of Putin's war in Ukraine and its possible future trajectory? Let's dive in. From the outset, Putin believed it would be a relatively short war, lasting a few weeks and with minimal casualties. What followed were months of fierce attritional fighting, with both sides and independent reports claiming higher and higher casualties. With the severe underestimation of the duration and extent of the war, it was likely that Putin believed that Russian casualties wouldn't reach more than a few hundred or a few thousand. But then the true figures started rolling in. With a large chunk of the world focused on the ongoing conflict, at least until Israel declared war on Hamas, it's understandable that both Russia and Ukraine would want to twist the narrative in their favor. Indeed, one of the first reports from Russia in June 2022 spoke of only 5,900 deaths in the Russian armed forces. On the other hand, reports from the US and UK suggested that the actual figure was closer to 15,000. Ukrainian reports went further still, stating that as many as 30,000 Russian soldiers had been killed in the first few months of the war. So which figure is correct? There's no way to know for certain, but a study published in the peer-reviewed scientific journal PNAS suggested that there's a method to how each country displays its losses. On average, Ukraine reports nearly double the number of actual Russian deaths, but doesn't have a bias towards reporting their own deaths. This is possibly in an attempt to gain further support from the countries sympathetic to Ukraine's cause, such as members of the EU and NATO that are supplying Ukraine with military aid. On the other hand, Russia severely underreports deaths of their own soldiers at a rate of roughly 0.3 per one actual death. Any figure from Russia, therefore, should be nearly tripled to get a value that's close to correct. Additionally, the Russian media reports Ukrainian deaths at a ratio of a staggering 4.3 to 1 meaning that Russians are led to believe that more than four times as many Ukrainians have died than have in reality. As a result, getting accurate figures on Russian casualties from either Ukrainian or Russian media can be a serious undertaking, considering the number fudging that the state media outlets do to further their own war agenda. Luckily, that's where unofficial reports from Russian media outlets and military or reports from independent media can shed light on the whole truth. One of the most notable reports coming from the Russian side was that of the Wagner Group, a private military group funded by the Russian government. In a May 2023 report that was mostly unauthorized by the state media, the then leader of Wagner, Yevgeny Prigozhin, revealed that the Wagner company lost around 22,000 troops and had 40,000 more injured. Based on that report and extrapolating from the size of Wagner compared to the Russian military, reports from the UK and US media suggested that Russia lost around 120,000 soldiers by August 2023, with another 170,000 wounded. This could support the numbers outlined in the PNAS study, which suggested that the actual deaths of Russians by February 2023 were around 77,000. As such, estimates by the UK and US media were on the right track though the actual numbers are much more difficult to confirm. That's where BBC Russia and Media Zona, an independent news outlet, joined forces to investigate wartime deaths thoroughly. Unlike traditional reports based solely on field reports and those from the militaries, the BBC delved deeper and tried to individually document every death on either side of the conflict. This was done through not only reports, but required actual military records, the circumstances that led to the death, and reports from the person's local area all of which would likely be more nuanced and detailed. In many cases, reporters went all over the country to extract information about the recently deceased from graveyards, parades, and war memorials, scouring for new names and graves. The investigators also searched for posts on social media from the deceased relatives and friends or obituaries published in local newspapers. The essence of the detailed search was that each death had to have a name attached. No longer were the numbers just figures that would pop into someone's head only to be forgotten a few seconds later. They were now real people who had died for their country, no matter how flawed the cause. This stringent set of criteria led to many of the deaths being overlooked due to the investigators' inability to confirm whether what was in the report from either Russian or Ukrainian outlets was actually true. 
However, with the BBC's backing of the data, the BBC Russia Media Zona report is considered the closest to the actual count of Russian soldier deaths, if not going under the real figure due to the aforementioned difficulties in obtaining the correct figures. If someone's name was on the list, then that means the person most likely existed and died during the Russo-Ukrainian War. The figures reported in October 2023 by BBC Russia suggested that Russia had lost around 88,000 soldiers 20 months into the war. BBC Russia didn't provide an estimate of the injured in that period, but the US news outlets reported around 170,000 injuries around August 2023, which was the most realistic estimate at the time. Better yet, the report was so detailed that the outlets could track down the deceased soldiers to the exact unit they served in. This served to create a detailed analysis of Russia's wartime efforts as well as the average number of soldiers present in the Russian military. The reports from the early months of the war roughly correlated with what you'd expect most common deaths to be, younger soldiers on the front lines, with the average being a 21-year-old male professional soldier. However, the figures from the later months in the report suggested that there was an increasing number of former prison inmates in the Wagner Group and pilots dying than usual. This is important for two reasons. First, it showcased that the Russian military, despite a widespread effort to conscript more soldiers, was bolstered by those most likely unwilling to actually fight for the country and were coerced into stepping onto the front lines. Inmates accounted for roughly 18.6% of all deaths recorded by BBC and MediaZona. This highlights the extent of desperation present in the Wagner Group to bolster its trained military with people considered expendable meat shields for the more vital soldiers in the units. Second, the deaths of pilots meant that Russia was being drained of highly specialized military troops that it couldn't train in time to replace the deceased. In some estimates, it takes roughly $3 million and multiple years to make a pilot combat ready. This means that each pilot taken down by Ukrainian forces results in the grounding of a part of Russia's air force. Another independent outlet, Medusa, worked alongside the previously mentioned Media Zone to conduct its own study on the Russian casualties during the war. Unlike the investigation done by the BBC, Medusa relied on information from the Russian probate registries, which are used when real estate or cars are inherited when their original owner dies. By going through the number of open cases that use the probate registry, Medusa could approximate the excess mortality in the Russian population. This methodology is akin to the estimates used during the COVID-19 pandemic, where Russia obfuscated the number of deaths in the country for similar reasons. Since the pandemic wasn't over in 2021, Medusa had to fall back down to data prior to 2020. The news website published its full methodology alongside the sources the outlet used to make their claims. According to its study, Medusa reported that Russia had 25,000 excess deaths by the end of 2022, which was likely most, if not all, from the Russo-Ukrainian war. Similarly, the outlet suggested around 47,000 excess deaths by May 2023, just five months after the first report, showcasing that the deaths sharply increased in 2023. If we take these figures to be true, then the estimate by the BBC of 88,000 deaths in October is probably as close to reality as we can get. But those are figures from mid to late 2023, and the war is still going. What are the most recently updated figures? According to the latest data presented by BBC Russia, the total Russian death toll could be as high as 107,000 as of February 2024, and that's not all. When compounded with the estimates of severe injuries that cause soldiers to be discharged from the service, the total losses of the Russian army could amount to as many as 321,000. This figure closely aligns with the numbers published by the US news outlets, suggesting around 315,000 losses. This accounts for more than 85% of the troops in Russia's pre-invasion available forces, which were around 360,000. Of the estimated 107,000 casualties over the course of 24 months, the war resulted in 53,500 casualties on the Russian side alone. Compare that to the other notable wars, and the figure is higher than the war in Iraq, 2013-17, 50,095 deaths per year, and the Syrian Civil War, 2011 to present, 43,736 deaths per year. When combined with the losses suffered by Ukraine, the death toll is a staggering 95,000 per year. This makes the Russo-Ukrainian War the deadliest conflict in the 21st century, beating out the Tigray War in Ethiopia. But the number of human casualties paints only part of the picture of the true losses suffered by Russia as a result of invading Ukraine. Also devastating have been the other military losses during the war, that of equipment and infrastructure. 
According to a February 2023 report, Russia lost roughly half of its battle-ready tanks a year into the war, crippling its ability to mount a unified offensive. This partly led to the drawn-out conflicts going on today, yet another report in April 2023 suggested that Russia has lost over 10,000 pieces of vital military equipment, including tanks, trucks, artillery, and drones. In some cases, the losses were so severe that the Russian military was forced to redeploy some Soviet and Cold War-era tanks, which were veritable museum pieces, in 2022. This is a huge downgrade in Russian military capacity. While the T-54s were among the peak tanks in the 20th century, their usefulness sharply dropped with new anti-tank weapons being developed in the late 80s and 90s. Today, a T-54 is no match for the most devastating weapons fielded by Ukraine that the UK, France, and the US have been steadily providing to the front lines. Furthermore, the T-54's 100mm guns struggle to penetrate modern armor, making them relatively useless in tank-to-tank -tank warfare. Considering that is a relatively rare occurrence, the T-54 still poses some threat to infantry and light, unarmored tanks and vehicles such as the Soviet-era Grad Launcher both sides are still using to this day. Comparatively, Ukraine has reintroduced most of its old weaponry, such as the T-55, but its fleet was upgraded with modern 105mm L7 guns capable of piercing through contemporary armor. Ukrainian tanks have also upgraded engines and tactical equipment, putting Russia woefully behind in technology on the front lines. According to some reports, Russia is even holding back its tanks for later use and trying to stockpile as many tanks as possible. This includes the newly built T-90s and the older T-62, T-72, and T-80s that Russia has pulled out of cold storage. As a result, most of the forces currently fighting on the front lines are purely infantry, and Russia is accruing more losses by the day. This could point to Russia trying to accumulate enough tanks for a final push in the future and is using its infantry as cannon fodder to try and lower Ukraine's defenses as much as possible before that happens. While this might sound like a dubious plan by Russia's military command, the fact is that Russia has roughly four times the population of Ukraine. While of course not everyone can be conscripted, the attritional nature of the war could lead to Russia gaining some ground in the long term since it can absorb heavier losses and regroup its efforts later. However, this has led to multiple waves of conscription efforts in the country, usually focused on lower-density regions. This is partially due to the comparatively lower salaries outside of the major cities, usually around $500 per month compared to $1,200 in Moscow. Additionally, a military contract provides up to $2,500 per month, making it lucrative to lower-earning people in remote provinces. As a result, other reports from Medusa suggest that people in far-off provinces are much more likely to be the casualties of the Russo-Ukrainian war. The outlet states that for every Moscovite that dies in the war, 275 people in Barachia and 350 people in Tuva die, which are some of the poorest regions predominantly inhabited by various minorities. It's not just the poor that have suffered over the course of the war. The conscription efforts have shaken the country to its core, resulting in waves of people emigrating from Russia to avoid being conscripted. If that wasn't the primary reason, then many more have suffered from Russia's attempts to subvert the public on how the war is actually going. In some extreme cases, the authorities have forbidden people from creating memorials for the fallen ones or spreading information about Russia's war efforts. According to some estimates, more than 900,000 Russians have left the country since the invasion. These are mostly people with the means to book prohibitively expensive flights or find other methods to legally escape the country. As such, they are primarily middle-class citizens, usually in IT and service sectors that brought significant income to the country via taxes. This is a huge blow to Russia's economy, but it's not the only one. Due to Russia's plentiful supply of oil and natural gas and the EU's previous lack of those resources, the country could command high prices on the market and invest significant funds into building a pipeline infrastructure. However, due to the invasion and most of Europe siding with Ukraine, that trade has trickled to a portion of what it used to be and has stopped altogether in some cases. This led to Russia needing to find an alternative source of funding to power its war machine. That's where China entered the picture. As a resource-demanding country with pretty much no access to oil and gas, as well as precious building materials and minerals internally, China has previously used overseas oil importers from the Persian Gulf. Recent geopolitical influence from the US in the area made China hesitant to fully rely on the Gulf as its sole source of oil and gas. For that reason, they had to diversify. Former Soviet countries such as Tajikistan account for a noticeable fraction of China's oil imports, but the country saw an opportunity in the new conflict between the Russians and Ukrainians. 
China positioned itself as one of Russia's biggest allies throughout the war, at least on the surface. It has not condemned any of Russia's military operations inside Ukraine and has consistently abstained in negotiations and discussions in the UN regarding Russia. Additionally, China has negotiated a significant trade deal with Russia for its oil, gas and resources from the Siberian Far East. Faced with losing a bulk of its export funding from the West, Russia was forced to accept exporting oil and gas to China at prices roughly half of those the resources had with its Western partners. Despite that, the Russian economy is still going relatively strong, even if it's becoming obvious that a bulk of it is solely oriented toward its war efforts. But it's still suffering from the inability to trade properly with other countries and extreme losses in manpower and equipment that requires a lot of funding to replace. As a result, Russia's central bank reported in 2023 that the country's inflation rate is roughly 11.1%. However, the actual prices paint a much grimmer picture of Russia's economy. Some economists suggest that the actual inflation rate in Russia is closer to 60%, with food prices spiking up to 75% compared to the figures from 2022. If this continues, Russia could end up with a runaway inflation problem that threatens the entire country's economy with collapse. This is bolstered by the fact that interest rates in Russia's banks have soared to 15%. The interest hike is not the first in the history of the Russo-Ukrainian war. Shortly after the invasion, banks set the interest rate to 20% but lowered them to normal levels shortly afterward. However, it looks like the current economic situation is dire enough that the interest rates will stay as is. It's forced many residents to move their disposable income into savings accounts, with estimates putting the deposit rates at 32%, much higher than those in the Western world, such as in the UK, with only 9%. The increased savings deposit can lead to a domino effect, with a significant chunk of money locked away in savings accounts. The Russian economy, or more accurately its citizens, won't have enough disposable capital to maintain itself. Regardless, the Russian media consistently reports that the country's economy is doing well, and the rest of the world begrudgingly agrees. The IMF reported that Russia's economy grew faster than any country currently on the G7 list – France, Germany, Italy, Canada, Japan, the UK and the US. This paints a bleak picture and suggests that the war might extend for a couple more years. But is this growth actually sustainable by any standards? The short answer is no. While Russia's economy is arguably doing well enough to support its war efforts, all measures taken by Russia's government are ultimately patchwork solutions that will create an unbalanced, highly centralized economy focused on the big Russian cities. Additionally, if the conscription efforts continue, there's probably going to be a lack of available recruits from Russia's poorer areas. This will mean that Russia will finally have to aggressively recruit from Moscow and other big cities. These are the same places that are powering Russia's propaganda machine. Currently, Moscovites don't feel the effect of the war on their daily life, apart from slightly increased prices in the country's capital. Their standard of living hasn't been affected yet. But if Russia is required to pull their recruits from the same people that are propping up the Russian economy and are completely oblivious to the real state of the country, the wall of illusion will break rapidly. With that comes the potential acknowledgement that Russia has lost more than just soldiers. The economy is being supported artificially. China has basically made Russia accept any and all terms in order to have their plentiful oil and gas exported at any price. The rest of Europe has seen that Putin's regime is no longer as ironclad as it used to be and is heavily dependent on the core of Russia being none the wiser about the reality of the war and fate of the country. If that happens, the consequences for Russia could be catastrophic. The current prognosis on the war is that Russia can't make a meaningful push into Ukraine in 2024 due to consistent setbacks in obtaining the right equipment, most of which is being imported from China. That means that Russia is facing another year of uncertainty where it must push more people into the war's meat grinder to maintain a semblance of superiority over Ukraine, at least in the eyes of its most devoted populace. As such, the future is uncertain. China's moves in recent years suggest that it might consider attacking Russia for the precious resources and drinking water of Siberia. However, it's more likely that China will keep up with an endless stream of demands to either prolong the war or enforce its own peace terms on both countries to get the best deal. Regardless, it's most likely that Russia will become nothing more than a Chinese puppet either exporting most of its resources to China in return for complete influence, both technologically and politically. Alternatively, China will actually invade Russia and take the country's resources for itself. In either case, Russia will likely cease being a meaningful player on the world stage and be forced to pander to Chinese whims. Of course, even these scenarios aren't certain. With the US hinting that China is not a severe threat to the world, 
it's likely that the US military has already poised itself to take advantage of any moves China makes and retaliate appropriately. But how? By cutting off the country's resource supplies to the south before it can recuperate from preying on Russia. That puts everyone in a state of stalemate. In any case, Russia has lost more than 1 million people overall, whether due to death, injuries, or widespread immigration, and its economy stands to lose even more. The fate of the country rests with Putin's current regime and whether it can gain a meaningful victory over Ukraine and enforce peace terms that enable the economy to bounce back. Otherwise, Russia may collapse in the same way the Soviet Union collapsed three decades before. But what do you think is going to happen with Russia? Let us know in the comments below and thank you for watching the video. Now, go and check out why Russia's military arsenal is low, weak, and outdated. Or click this other video instead. Throughout the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian conflict, neither side has managed to exert air superiority. Despite Russia's larger fleet, Ukraine's clever use of air and anti-air defenses, supercharged by NATO-supplied weapons, has kept Russian planes at bay. But the game could change. Late in 2023, the US made a pivotal move by agreeing to send F-16s to Ukraine, making a first in Ukrainian aviation history. Could these jets tip the scales, offering Ukraine a chance to claim the skies? The F-16, though not the newest kid on the block, is no slouch. As a versatile, late fourth-generation fighter, it's not just about achieving air superiority. It's about providing a flexible option for both attack and defense. Thanks to its all-round capabilities, the F-16 has secured its spot as a mainstay in the fleets of numerous countries and stands as a pillar among NATO forces, outpacing older Soviet and Chinese models. Could the introduction of the F-16s into Ukraine's arsenal rewrite the aerial warfare playbook? Let's explore what these jets bring to the high-stakes aerial duel. When it comes to the supposed efficiency of the F-16s, it's important to compare them to the powerhouse of the Russian and Ukrainian air forces, the Su-27. From a technical standpoint, both F-16s and Su-27s belong to the fourth generation of combat aircraft, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. The Su-27 was designed to be an air-to-air -air dogfighting and air superiority aircraft. It's fast and efficient at taking out enemy air forces. With a top airspeed of about 160 miles per hour more than the F-16, an Su-27 can outmaneuver other similar aircraft in close-range combat. Keep in mind that the Su-27s that Russia and Ukraine use are technically not the same aircraft. Both Russia and Ukraine inherited their fleets of Su-27s from the Soviet era, yet Russia has since enhanced its aircraft with significant upgrades. Moreover, Russia's arsenal includes the advanced Su-35s, giving it a broader range of modern aerial capabilities. Despite these challenges, Ukraine has shown resilience and adaptability with its available Soviet-era aircraft. In 2022, Ukraine faced tough losses, with 62 aircraft down during combat missions. Given that Ukraine's air force comprises about 80 fourth-generation MiG-29 and Su-27s, these losses impacted the number of operations conducted in 2023. Remarkably, the losses were reduced to seven aircraft in that year, underscoring the Air Force's strategic adjustments and efforts to preserve its fleet. This reduction in losses highlights Ukraine's capability to adapt and continue its aerial defense efforts, despite having lost approximately 40% of its air power. Ukraine's Air Force relies on its existing fleet and international support, as the country does not currently produce new aircraft. This reliance on older models and the challenge of securing spare parts for maintenance are significant hurdles. However, the potential integration of Western aircraft like the F-16 into Ukraine's arsenal could open new avenues for enhancing its aerial capabilities, offering hope for bolstering Ukraine's defensive and offensive air strategies. Still, the reliance on already obsolete aircraft has turned the Russo-Ukrainian battle into a prolonged war of attrition. In light of the heavy losses accrued during 2022, Ukrainian tactics have shifted from aerial attacks on Russian soil to mid-range operations to take out key pieces of the Russian army infrastructure and command. The tactic is bolstered by the fact that Ukraine has already received plenty of ground-to-air missiles and weaponry, allowing its army to support air operations with anti-air defenses. Ukrainian aircraft, therefore, can launch a hit-and-run attack on Russian forces and duck behind the heavy Ukrainian air defenses making the operations less likely to result in the loss of aircraft. But this air battle isn't straightforward. 
Russia does possess a bigger fleet with around 100 Su-27s and an additional 130 of the more advanced Su-35s, and Russian radars spotting targets from 100 miles away outrange Ukraine's 55-mile reach, letting them spot and counter threats, including drones and missiles, sooner. Their R-77 missiles can hit targets from 80 miles out, a capability Ukraine lacks, putting Ukrainian jets at risk before they even know what hit them. But despite these advantages, the fight for air dominance remains at a deadlock. Russia doesn't have enough concentrated long-range capabilities to take out NATO-provided air defenses. Similarly, Ukrainian planes don't have the range to reach further out from the same defenses and strike key Russian infrastructure and military hardware to make a meaningful advance. That's where the F-16 aims to completely overturn the tide of battle. F-16s have a more powerful radar system, which has a range of over 110 miles in its most potent version. This gives the jet a significant edge over Russia's improved Su-27s in target acquisition and tactics. Additionally, getting F-16s also means that Ukraine will gain access to modern missiles that are compatible with the plane's mechanisms. Most notably, this includes the AIM-120 AMRAAM, which is one of the most versatile and destructive missiles in active use. AIM-120s have a range of 65 to 100 miles and have gained a fearsome reputation due to their use in various wars during the 21st century. It's one of the hallmarks of America's ongoing air supremacy, and its capability to lock onto and track a target fills a hole in Ukraine's arsenal. The missiles easily outgun Russia's R-77s, which will allow Ukraine to penetrate deeper into occupied territory or Crimea and even strike at targets on the Russian mainland. The active radar system inside the R-77s and AIM-120s also means pilots won't have to maintain a lock onto their targets. The system slots perfectly into Ukraine's existing hit-and-run tactics, meaning that pilots can combine their experience with modernized ordnance and planes to gain an advantage. Giving Ukraine F-16s and AIM-120s will provide stability against Russia and maintain control over its airspace. One of the key factors that makes F-16s considerably more powerful than their Soviet counterparts is their general reliability. F-16s have an expected lifespan of between 3,500 and 4,500 flight hours. Accordingly, their components are generally expected to last for that period, and the airplane can remain in service with minor repairs and maintenance. After that, the mechanical parts have a much higher chance of breaking down due to wear and tear, and the wiring might fray and damage important electrical components. By contrast, older Soviet MiGs and Shukhois only have an expected lifespan in the range of 2,000 to 3,500 hours. Similarly to how Ukraine had to reduce flight operations between 2022 and 23 to counter airplane loss, Russia has also had to moderate its air force use. The oldest aircraft that Russia has used, MiG-29s and Su-27s, are much closer to the end of their lifespan. Furthermore, since Russia needs to mount an offensive, its planes typically have to fly in from farther bases, making each operation more demanding on Russian aircraft than Ukrainian aircraft. In fact, the prolonged nature of the war between Russia and Ukraine has also brought about a major concept in maintaining air superiority called imputed losses. The concept refers to the fact that the military will lose some of its key equipment or weaponry not due to enemy fire, but to parts breaking down from wear and tear. According to estimates by the RAND Corporation, Russia has lost between 30 and 60 aircraft solely to imputed losses over the last two years. If we take the average value, around 45 planes have been grounded because their parts can no longer operate. Russia has needed to fly their planes more frequently and push them to their limits, but it doesn't have enough manufacturing capacity to offset those losses. Based on RAND's report, Russia can produce between 18 and 36 modern aircraft per year and it's assumed that it will need to cut down its Air Force operating capacity further to maintain its existing fleet. Since the country is still midway through replacing old Soviet-era planes with Su-35s, it's possible that they will prioritize using Su-27s. The main reason being that it will become prohibitively expensive to maintain a fleet of Su-27s. Russia might consider putting them up as sacrificial lambs in combat to allow more modern aircraft a better chance of survival. This means that Ukraine is more likely to see Su-27s and other fourth-generation aircraft used against them over the course of the war. With many reports suggesting that Russia doesn't have a concrete plan of pushing into Ukraine for the rest of 2024, it's possible that this would be Ukraine's time to push back on Russia's encroachment into their airspace. And that's where the newly donated F-16s could prove pivotal. These planes are coming from Denmark, around 25 aircraft, and the Netherlands, roughly 52 aircraft. 
The planes are likely relatively well preserved since the countries involved haven't needed to use their air force to a great extent over the past 20 years. With F-16s being a more competitive aircraft model, Russia will have no choice but to activate more of its air force to compensate. This will lead to further use of both modern and obsolete aircraft in the VKS, the Russian Aerospace Forces, increasing how often they perform sorties to counteract the F-16's improved radar detection and targeting range and avoid infrastructural losses. As a result, the increased aircraft usage will compound the imputed losses that the force will suffer throughout the war. Therefore, Russia might actively lose whatever advantage it has managed to hold on to for the last two years. Ukraine might even be able to take back contested areas, or at least manage to maintain air superiority over them. This will allow them to mount a concerted counter-offensive should the Russians ever falter on any front. Finally, if F-16s give Ukraine control over its airspace, they can be used to make offensive strikes deeper into Russian territory, taking out key artillery pieces that make ground combat more favorable for the Ukrainian forces. These victories in Ukrainian airspace could also prove fantastic for improving morale in the Ukrainian army. The soldiers have already managed to stave off the invasion with incredibly limited access to newer technology and being heavily outnumbered. With the addition of more advanced and reliable aircraft, they could push the Russians further out of Ukraine. But if the F-16s would have made so much difference for the Ukrainian forces, why have deliveries only started in late 2023? The answer to that hinges on the volatile state of global geopolitics. Over the past few years, Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has issued statements suggesting that the US delivering F-16s to Ukraine would be seen as a direct threat to Russia. This stems from the fact that F-16s technically have the capacity to carry nuclear warheads instead of traditional missiles, at least according to the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Some have speculated that Russia will be willing to push the nuclear button on what it perceives to be grave transgressions against the country's efforts in Eastern Europe. This could plunge the entire world into a war, with many sides accruing significant losses as nuclear weapons are dispatched by all countries who own them. It should be noted that this is a similar strategy Putin has exercised in the past, even at the beginning of the invasion after it was clear that Ukraine wouldn't fall in 10 days. However, if the US took a chance and gave Ukraine F-16s at the start of the 2022 conflict, there's no telling whether Russia would follow through with that threat. But in recent years, Russia has pretty much exhausted its diplomatic options. With the Western countries becoming independent from Russia's oil and gas, Putin was forced to turn to China and India and other smaller trading partners to compensate for the income loss. However, that means that Russia has lost the upper hand in many negotiations and is currently positioning itself as a minor trading partner for China. As a result, leaders in the US and NATO were likely considering that the threats from Russia were empty and decided that they wouldn't lose too much and decided that they wouldn't lose much if they donated F-16s to Ukraine. Additionally, Russia's repeated attacks on civilian infrastructure has seen an increase in public support for Ukraine and may have encouraged the US to act faster to help shorten the war. The versatility of F-16s to carry both air-to-ground and air-to-air -air missiles means that they can be used to take down enemy drones and ordnance conducting strikes on civilian targets. Russia's situation is further complicated by the fact that its main ally throughout this war, China, seems to have gone silent on the matter. Considering China's goals to reduce American influence in the Indo-Pacific, it may be preparing to go to war with either the US or Russia to expand its claims and obtain more resources. That puts Russia in a hard situation where they won't have the backing of the world's second superpower should they make an impulsive decision. With the arrival of the F-16s, Ukraine will get a sizable boost in firepower. This comes in the form of advanced missile guidance systems that the planes can carry. While Ukraine already has access to some of the latest missiles available, such as the Storm Shadows, their capabilities were stunted by the fact that the MiG-29 and Su-27 weren't native platforms that can carry and guide them. The Ukrainian army had to cobble together makeshift carrying systems that could take these missiles into the air and launch them at the enemy. However, their range and accuracy took a hit, and their usefulness as precision strike missiles were largely nullified. With the addition of the F-16s, though, the army can now make full use of advanced weaponry to close the gap between Russia's numerical and technological superiority. Apart from the storm shadows, one potential game-changer associated with the F-16 donation is the AGM-88 Harm missile. This is an anti-radar missile that eradicates enemy positioning systems, thereby disabling them from launching long-range precision strikes. With these capabilities in Ukraine's possession, Russia will need to position its key artillery infrastructure closer to the border or withdraw it entirely. 
Furthermore, this strategic repositioning will also play to Ukraine's advantage. Due to the F-16's longer radar range and long-range capabilities, Ukraine will be able to exert more pressure on Russia's artillery, allowing it to eliminate Russia's long-range support equipment. What the F-16 will also bring to the table is improved mission control and tactical information access. Su-27s still rely on analog interfaces and gauges to display relevant information. However, since each display is limited to one piece or type of data, the cockpit of an Su-27 is loaded with displays and knobs, creating an information overload for the pilot. On the other hand, F-16s have integrated digital display systems. The digital screen allows the pilot to switch between different viewing modes and information panels. Apart from reducing visual clutter, the digital display has a much higher fidelity and responsiveness. All information that a pilot needs to consider at any given time can be accessed with a switch. However, the F-16 isn't the perfect solution for the Ukrainian military just yet. One of the most critical hurdles that need to be overcome is the lack of experienced pilots who can effectively navigate the F-16's modern systems. Since the Ukrainian Air Force so far has had no direct contact with F-16s, its pilots have never been trained on its modules. According to some estimates, it would take between four and six months to retrain a pilot from an Su-27 to an F-16. This is further complicated by the fact that most Ukrainian soldiers aren't proficient in English. While this might not seem significant, it's important to remember that training manuals and manufacturing manuals are rarely translated into languages as uncommon as Ukrainian, which is spoken as a main language only in Ukraine itself. This means that the US or another NATO country would need to partake in a monumental task of translating all manuals to Ukrainian while ensuring they are consistent and logical. Since this wasn't seen as a priority at the time, another option is to teach Ukrainian pilots English to a sufficient level. Even the few Ukrainian pilots who are proficient in English and can start training immediately need between two and four months before they would be combat ready. Additionally, F-16s require a different military airport strip setup. Soviet planes from the 20th century were designed to be operated from remote areas with minimal ground control support and short takeoff and landing strips. By contrast, the F-16 has a lengthier takeoff procedure. MiG-29 and Su-27 planes have built-in ruggedness that ensures that the planes can endure adverse takeoff conditions, which the F-16 isn't particularly built for. For example, there have been videos of MiG planes being able to take off from regular civilian roads, something that's pretty much unthinkable for more modern aircraft. As a result, Ukraine will have a much more limited number of military airfields that can be used to field and deploy F-16s from the country. Due to the more elaborate logistical planning and reduced options, Russia might have an easier time spotting and monitoring airstrips that are used to deploy F-16s into the fray. To reduce the risks, Ukraine's best option is to field its F-16s in the western portions of the country, which are the furthest from the Russian front. However, this reduces the effective range of the jets, which would reduce their combat prowess. This is further compounded by the fact that F-16s actually have a lower travel range than Su-27s. While their fuel tanks are almost four times larger, the newer airplane chugs through fuel much quicker. A purely defensive position on the opposite side from the front would be economically inefficient, making the Ukrainian army much more reliant on fuel import than usual. Finally, F-16s are much more difficult to maintain than older Soviet aircraft. According to some estimates, the Su-27 requires 11 hours of maintenance for each flight hour, while an F-16 needs 17 hours for the same flight time. Additionally, Ukraine will be hard-pressed to adequately train its ground crews to maintain the craft. NATO countries can contract out ground crews, but that still poses a risk of having foreign civilians in a warring country. Regardless of the challenges involved in the process of integrating F-16s into the Ukrainian Air Force, the West remains cautious about donating these aircraft. While a big reason for that is the general unwillingness to let the war prolong even further, Western countries are also heavily incentivized to do so. The F-16s donated to Ukraine won't be brand new aircraft just out of the factories. All planes going to Ukraine will be older vehicles that haven't seen much combat and real use, but that are becoming obsolete and replaced with newer designs. By donating the F-16s to Ukraine, NATO countries can offload the cost of decommissioning the airplanes and their surrounding equipment and support. It might not seem like much, but removing a jet from active duty requires a significant logistical effort, which takes time and money to implement. By offloading those planes to Ukraine, the US, Denmark and the Netherlands can save some of that money and provide much-needed political and military support to the country. 
It also showcases to the world that the West stays united with Ukraine in their fight against Russia. Despite these challenges, the F-16s should start seeing active use in Ukraine by the second quarter of 2024, with delivery orders being fulfilled until 2025 if the war continues. While Russia remains undeterred by the progress of Ukrainian aerial forces, Ukraine is well on its way to implementing training programs to use the aircraft to their fullest. With this injection of firepower, Ukraine will gain renewed hope of prolonging and turning the tide of the war. While the bulk of Russia's air supremacy comes from a larger fleet, F-16s will allow Ukraine to get up to speed technologically with the modernized Su-27s and even be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Su-35s. And even though the F-16s are by now considered obsolete compared to the modern F-35s, they can still have a few final hurrahs in the Russo-Ukrainian war. Despite the fact Ukraine might not be able to field them for another few months, the army has shown considerable enthusiasm into making full use of these aircraft. With that, the F-16 will be remembered as another high point in the history of 20th century military aircraft design. How do you think the fight between Ukraine's F-16s and Russia's Su-27s and Su-35s will play out? Will the aircraft be enough to give Ukraine a better fighting chance, or do you think it's a case of too little, too late, and that the jets should have been deployed at the start of the conflict? Let us know in the comment section. Now go and check out how the F-35 could achieve air dominance in Ukraine within 24 hours, or click this other video instead. Throughout the 21st century, Russia and China's economic ties have openly deepened. However, the relationship between these two superpowers is a strenuous one, and it wouldn't take much to make them mortal enemies. What would it take? And if either of these two countries did attack each other, what would prompt them to do so, and who would win? While neither country is willing to admit the reality of their relationship, the signs are there. To understand them, we need to delve into their geopolitical histories. Both countries have long traditions rich in warfare and attempts to claim superiority in their respective regions. For Russia, that's the Great Eurasian Steppe. Russia's historical ties to the steppe can be traced back to its origins as an Eastern Slavic country. However, the geography of northeastern Europe is steeped in low-lying flatland that is incredibly difficult to defend against invaders due to its sheer size and exposure. And Russia has been on the receiving end of many invasions, with perhaps the most notable being the Napoleonic Wars. Although Russia fended off the French, it showcased the relative ease with which the European part of Russia could be attacked via the Germanic lands. That's why Russia has spent considerable resources to secure its European borders and relations, which came to a head in the 20th century with the USSR. Apart from being at its peak territorially, Russia held diplomatic ties with most of Eastern Europe through the Warsaw Pact, which elevated its influence over most of the Eurasian steppe. But the situation didn't last. With the USSR dissolving and many European countries joining the US-led NATO, Russia's borders of influence were equated to its actual borders, perilously close to the country's main population centers in Europe. China's territory has ebbed and flowed over the millennia. China's current policy seems focused on claiming parts of territories it has historically owned, including but not limited to Taiwan, parts of India in the Himalayas, and swathes of the South China Sea. These territorial disputes have brought the US and several Indo-Pacific countries together to form the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue (QSD) or the Quad to curb China's influence in the area. The main thorn in China's internal and external diplomacy is Taiwan, technically led by the Republic of China, which it considers a rebellious remnant of the country that needs to be brought back into the fold. However, Taiwan has the military and diplomatic backing of the US. If China decided to abandon diplomacy and invade Taiwan, it would be no doubt met by US armed Taiwanese forces, with the rest of the Quad following close behind. This would likely create a prolonged war similar to the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Further complicating China's foreign policy is its robust yet fragile domestic industry. As a country with the second largest population on Earth, China is woefully lacking in natural resources to support that many people working and producing for the economy. China imports most of its oil and natural gas, as well as mineral, drinking water and timber. What makes the US particularly dangerous to China's economy is the fact that most of its oil and natural gas supplies come through shipments from the Persian Gulf. Furthermore, a vast majority of this sea traffic has to pass through the tightly controlled Strait of Malacca. To salvage the situation, China claims most of the South China Sea, almost up to the strait itself, and opposes most other countries with access to the ocean. 
Still, if China decided to attack Taiwan or seriously try to control its portions of the South or East China Sea, it would no doubt be opposed by the Indo-Pacific countries. As a result, the strait would likely be shut off to Chinese vessels. This would cripple the Chinese resource-demanding economy and would likely result in the country's collapse as we know it, with unfathomable consequences for world politics. With opposition from all sides, it would seem natural that Russia and China would become allies in an attempt to curb the American influence on its borders. NATO for Russia, the Quad for China. However, this is the point where history gets complex. You see, while China and Russia are currently presenting a united front against the US, their historical ties are more hostile than you might think. Even when both countries were communist in the mid-20th century, the regimes clashed over their interpretation of Marxism-Leninism. But the most contested Chinese-Russian relations are due to two treaties in the mid-19th century. During the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, Imperial China was under heavy political, diplomatic, and military pressure from colonial and foreign imperial forces, starting with the Opium Wars and ending with the country's reinvention as the Communist People's Republic of China. The 110 years of opposition from the West has been dubbed as the Century of Humiliation by the Chinese, with many politicians repeatedly citing all the losses China suffered during that period. As part of the Century of Humiliation, China was forced to sign several so-called unequal treaties, in which China had to cede parts of its territory, control, or other diplomatic material. With Russia in particular, the two most important treaties were the 1858 Treaty of Aigun and the 1860 Treaty of Peking, which resulted in China losing the province of Outer Manchuria. While Chinese officials claim that the province isn't a point of contention, reality begs to differ. The division made by the two treaties was somewhat ambiguous, resorting to using the two main rivers in the region, Amur and Usuri, as borders between Russia and China. However, Russia claims that all the islands in the river belong to Russia, while China claims that the border goes through the middle of the rivers, assigning the islands to a country based on its location against the middle of the river. In fact, the entire area has been hotly contested by China. Even in the 20th century, a seven-month military conflict between the Chinese and the Russians took place over the contested islands, particularly the Zenbao or Damansky Island on the Asuri. The two-week battle over Zenbao resulted in hundreds of casualties on both sides and created more than three and a half decades of tension over the islands. Furthermore, the sedimentary island, called Bolshoi Uzariski Island or Haixazi Island, has also been a sore spot in China's history. It stands in the confluence of the rivers, right on the border between the two countries. Claims over the island's territory have been going on since the treaties. Eventually, the two countries ratified the control of the island in a 2004 agreement that split the island between them and permitted China to use the Amur and Usor rivers for ship traffic. However, it seems China hasn't caught up to the agreement just yet. In a map published in 2023, China displayed the entirety of the Bolshoi Uzariski Island as being under Chinese control. While this may have been an oversight, it could also mean that China has plans regarding the previously debated region. The island itself is an undeveloped piece of land and would be an afterthought were it not for its favorable geographical position. Lying at the confluence of Amur and Usuri, the island is perilously close to Khabarovsk, the second largest city in Outer Manchuria, which overlooks the island. Since Russia controls the portion of the island on the confluence of Amur and Asuri, it can also control the shipping routes that are usable when the river isn't iced over. The Amur also has considerable hydroelectric and fishing capacity, something that China could greatly use due to its reliance on energy imports. Additionally, China's Ministry of Natural Resources has issued a statement relabeling cities and provinces in the Outer Manchuria region, which belongs to Russia, with Chinese names, usually historical ones from before the treaties. While it might seem that the region is relatively useless to China, you have to keep the bigger picture in mind. Outer Manchuria is one of the most populated and industrialized regions of the Russian Far East, with two cities having over 600,000 inhabitants, Khabarovsk and Vladivostok. The region is inhabited by around 4 million people, half of the entire Russian Far East population, compared to over 100 million people in the neighboring Chinese provinces. If war were to break out, China would have a massive initial manpower advantage, and the people could easily inhabit the sparsely populated Russian region after the fact. What makes Outer Manchuria a possible first front of the Sino-Russo War is also the aforementioned fact that China is a relatively resource-deprived nation. Since there are roughly 1 billion people in the country, China has a massive resource demand for energy, minerals, and even drinking water. 
Currently, most of the country, even though it contains some of the biggest rivers in the world, can barely produce enough to satisfy the population's need. Additionally, the biggest population center in the North China Plain has pretty much no natural drinking water supply, relying on the rest of the country and imports for its drinking water sources. As a result, China is looking for ready water supplies elsewhere, with two lucrative options – India and Russia. With pre-existing territorial disputes with India, China could potentially look into invading the water-rich Himalayan region it stakes a claim to. However, India itself houses the largest population in the world and faces a similar water scarcity problem, relying on the same region for drinking water. This makes the country much more defensive of the contested territory. Add to that the fact that India is in the Quad and also has beneficial trade relations with the West, and the US, Quad and NATO would come down hard on China if it started an invasion on Indian soil. This leaves Russia as one of the key interest points for acquiring more resources. In terms of drinking water, Siberia is generally river-rich. However, by far the largest concentration of drinking water is in Lake Balkai, the biggest lake by volume, outstripping all Great Lakes combined, with estimates suggesting it could support the world population for decades by itself. In fact, a Chinese company aggressively purchased land around the lake in the 2010s, with plans to construct a pipeline and supply China with fresh water in 2017. The local population protested about the construction, and the Russian government intervened, forcing the Chinese company to abandon any plans to build up Lake Balkai. This doesn't mean that China will keel over. With its economy highly dependent on resources that it currently needs to import, and much of its oil and natural gas imports coming from either the Strait of Malacca or Russia itself, China might look to remove one of the middlemen from the equation. Since its south is bound in overseas territorial disputes and influenced by US foreign policies, Russia might be the next obvious choice. Without a Manchuria as the entryway, China could gain access to the entire Siberian region, which is rich in oil, natural gas, minerals, timber and water. All the resources the country desperately needs to function. Furthermore, with the Russian Far East so far removed from the population and influence centers in Europe, and the Russian army currently embroiled in its own war with Ukraine, China could consider invading Russia at any moment. This way, Beijing would gain the upper hand and succeed in a quick war, the kind Putin previously failed to accomplish in Ukraine two years prior. Remember, most of the issues that Russia is facing right now in Ukraine are due to intervention from NATO countries. The same issues that likely won't provide Russia with any assistance against China. However, a Chinese invasion might prompt the US and the Quad to exercise their own plans to cut off China in the south possibly creating a chain reaction of war declarations similar to that of the World Wars. Additionally, Outer Manchuria and the Siberian region by extension would provide China with greater access to the Pacific coastline through the Sea of Japan or the Russian Pacific coastline itself. In fact, if China were determined to bring the entirety of the Russian Far East under its own control, it could gain access to the Arctic shore itself. This is vital for an entirely different reason. You see, the main shipping routes around Eurasia and Africa currently rely on the Suez Canal and the Strait of Hormuz, followed by the Strait of Malacca, to transport goods between Western Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Alternatively to the Suez-Hormuz line would be the Cape of Good Hope, Southern Horn of Africa, a route that is around 4,000 nautical miles longer. But the Arctic contains a sea and a lot of ice that's navigable for at least a part of the year during warmer months, when the ice cover is smaller. While the Arctic was previously relatively unused for maritime transport for that reason, global warming has changed the situation rapidly. A change of even a few degrees Celsius has been enough to drastically reduce the ice sheet over the Arctic Circle and open up previously inaccessible waters to ships. The Russian-controlled Northern Sea Route is currently the biggest and the shortest trading route in the region, with the other option going through the Northwest Route in Alaskan and Canadian waters. According to some studies, Arctic routes could be between 30 and 50% shorter, either in time spent at sea or distance, than those using the Suez or Panama canals, while eliminating the possible bottlenecks at the two artificial channels, a fact that became painfully obvious in the Evergreen incident in 2021. The tenuous geopolitics in Russia leave it open for influence from both the West, with which it is in a proxy war through Ukraine, and China, where it sells oil, gas, and other resources for the much-needed capital to fuel its economy and military efforts. The current situation plays well into China's hands, giving them unparalleled reach into Siberia through ongoing trade, all without actually needing to invest resources in invading the country or forcing Russia to accept the deal.
With Russia stuck in a prolonged war it seemingly has no way of getting out of, it was forced to sell oil and gas to China at roughly half the rate it did to European countries. Naturally, this gives China a clear economic benefit from the Russo-Ukrainian war. As such, it works in China's favor to have Russia occupy the US and EU military efforts into Ukraine, while at the same time siphoning the resources it needs from Russia without resorting to trade through the Strait of Malacca. This has led to China famously not condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine and abstaining in any peace talks or dialogues to end the war in the region. It's quite clear that Putin's regime is working out well for China, and the country will likely remain a stern ally so long as the situation doesn't change. Furthermore, while the previous two years might have led everyone to believe Russia has a robust economy and is a veritable superpower in its own right, the truth is a bit more nuanced. Russia's population is roughly one-tenth of China's, and while the countries have a comparable GDP gross domestic product per capita, China's size gives it a clear edge. In fact, in current estimates, China is the world's second-largest economy, while Russia makes it to 11th place by total GDP. The economic disparity and Russia's military, economic, and diplomatic losses that followed the invasion of Ukraine make any deals fall naturally in China's favor. So long as Russia is cut off from the rest of the world financially, it's forced to accept China's terms in order to sell its resources and power its economy. However, the melting Arctic ice might put a dent in that plan. If Russia were able to operate independent shipping year-round and impose tariffs on goods traveling through the Northeast route, it could create a secondary stream of income and gain a semblance of economic independence from China. Additionally, just because Russia's current regime is favorable to China doesn't mean that the situation will stay that way. The war in Ukraine might be protracted, but it won't last forever, and Russia might reconsider its allegiance to China in the long run and cut off resource export to China from its far east. Many experts believe that Russia doesn't have the military power to press further into Ukraine in 2024. With Ukraine steadily holding on to the support it receives from the EU and NATO, the war might be reaching a breaking point within the next few years. While there are a few possibilities on how the war will end, one of the predictions is that Russia's current regime will collapse. This will pave the way for a different leadership, with a potentially revolutionary outlook on Russia's long-term future in both Europe and Asia. The leadership might align itself more with Europe, China, or a third party altogether, and some of those scenarios might stop it from playing right into China's hands. If Russia does end up weakened enough from the Ukrainian war or start opposing its ongoing trade with China, then China wouldn't have many options left, since the current regime under Xi is fervently opposed to the influence radiating from the US onto the Indo-Pacific, the resource-starved Chinese will need to obtain more goods from its north, i.e. Russia. This circles back to the seemingly solved dispute between Russia and China on the matter of which country controls parts of Outer Mancuria. While China has gained back most of the territories it lost during the century of humiliation, the provinces of Outer Mancuria are still under Russian control. Given that China is still pressing claims on areas it had long lost any legal ties on and are loosely historically connected to China, such as the claims in the South China Sea, it's highly likely to reverse course on its previous agreements with Russia and claim back the lost provinces in Manchuria. Considering the present economic and demographic inequality between the regions separated by the Amur and Asuri, China's invasion would likely be swift and deadly. In all likelihood, it would displace or culturally assimilate the Russians in the area before reinforcements from the European parts of Russia could arrive. Since the area is already starting to be influenced by China due to ongoing trade, it's also possible that China might imitate the Russian annexation of Crimea to gain access to the Japanese Sea. Alternatively, it might begin its advance into the rest of the Russian Far East. In essence, what is currently happening in Ukraine could be repeated in the way Russia wants to diversify its port access and limit the influence of other countries on its economy, China could do the same thing in the future to Russia. With Russia weakened from the war, it's unlikely to remain the world's 11th economy for long and will likely be shattered by conflicting ideologies from within. That would leave Russia underpopulated, underrepresented, and underdeveloped. Yet the resource-rich and highly lucrative Far East will be ripe for the taking by the country that stands to gain the most from utilizing those resources. China. The only question that remains is how China will actually attack Russia. While China's current policy is non-interference, the country could reverse that course and try to sponsor a deal between Russia and Ukraine. During peace accords, China may impose its own influence on both Russia and Ukraine, forcing either country to accept whatever terms China deems best for its own agenda. 
In exchange, China would fund reconstruction and reinvigoration efforts in the war-struck areas of Ukraine. On the surface, the EU would likely welcome this deal, as Ukraine's reconstruction efforts are most likely going to be funded by the EU. Talks about the country joining the EU in an expedited process have been underway for some time. This would also suit China's plans to undercut the US influence around the world. If the EU doesn't have to support yet another country and can rely on Chinese-brought infrastructure in Ukraine, the US doesn't have as much leverage. While the EU is currently importing Norwegian and American oil and gas, the end of the Russo-Ukrainian war could drastically change the trading routes on a global scale. With Russia free to resume exporting oil and gas to Europe, the US will lose one of its biggest export partners. It's currently unknown whether Russia can actually satisfy the needs of both China and the EU, but China could support the trade if it retains its influence on Russian politics and economy. Even if China doesn't create a lucrative offer to end the Russo-Ukrainian war, it could end the war forcefully by pulling the plug on economically supporting Russia. While Russia would likely retaliate by cutting off the resources from Siberia, China could open up claims to Outer Mancuria as a proxy. By invading Russia, it can take hold of the resources itself and cut out the middleman from the equation. Before long, China could feasibly gain access to the Sea of Japan or even freezing Siberian ports in the Arctic, allowing it to bypass the Strait of Malacca and place its products directly into Western Europe. In the end, while Russia and China's current stance is that the countries have an alliance, in actuality, Russia is only a few steps away from becoming China's vassal or being attacked by China's numerically superior forces while being completely unprotected from Europe. Then it's up to China to decide what claims it would pursue and to the US and the rest of the Quad to determine how to proceed in creating a new world order. It should be mentioned that all of these scenarios are only rough approximations or conjectures each one is based on the current events in Russia, Ukraine, and the geopolitics surrounding the China-US rivalry in the Indo-Pacific. If something drastically changes in the foreign policies of either of the parties, China could be facing a much worse war against the entirety of the US and the Quad before it strikes against Russia. But what do you think? Is China going to attack Russia, or is it still too afraid of American countermeasures? In the event China does attack, will it press far into Siberia or settle by regaining the region of Outer Mancuria? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more military content from military experts. At this point, we're pretty sure that Putin is sticking his head into a paper bag in panic and trying not to hyperventilate on a daily basis. While he has several reasons for doing this, losing thousands of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine, the ongoing NATO expansion, coup attempts, and more, there's another looming threat that he can't seem to escape. Ukraine is equipped with US weapons, and Russia can't seem to stop them. But why? Is Putin really that incompetent? What are these weapons, and how come Putin can't fight them off? Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine began more than a year ago, the United States has committed more than $45 billion worth of aid to help the country defend its sovereignty. Much of this has taken the form of high-tech, lethal military equipment. The assistance has proven to be critical for Ukraine's battlefield success and a nightmare for Putin and his top military planners. Now 19 months into the conflict, it could make all the difference in Ukraine's slowly growing counter-offensive. So let's take a look at what equipment the US has sent so far. What else might it be planning to send? And why Russian troops seem to be so helpless against US exported firepower? Among the most important weapons the US has sent so far to Ukraine is the FGM-148 Javelin, a potent anti-tank guided missile system or ATGM. Jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin first entered service in 1996 as a replacement for the older M47 Dragon missile. It has also proven to be one of the most effective pieces of US military aid. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 javelins since the start of the invasion and has put them to remarkable use. Each javelin system consists of two parts, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit, or CLU. The CLU works as the brains of the javelin and features four times magnification as well as night vision and thermal sights. This allows for independent target verification, meaning small, independent squads can use javelins effectively. Before firing, a 12 times magnification setting allows users to zoom in on a target for identification. To fire, the gunner switches to a seeker FOV mode with 9 times magnification, 
which is fed into the missile's guidance unit to lock onto a target. One of the Javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory. It features two modes, direct fire and top attack. In top attack mode, its missiles travel in a high arc, in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Its automatic infrared guidance and fire and forget design also allows the user to seek cover immediately after launch and avoid retaliatory strikes. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with powerful 19-pound tandem warheads. A primary charge penetrates the thick composite armor, while a secondary charge follows and detonates inside the tank. However, these features also make Javelins expensive, at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Money aside, Javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back-and-forth of artillery barrages trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. Countless videos like this one shared by Yahoo News have shown unsuspecting Russian troops and tank columns rolling into ambushes by Javelin-wielding Ukrainians. As the Javelins are fired, tanks and other armored vehicles can be seen exploding and catching fire. One tank was able to fire before it was struck and immobilized, billowing smoke. At one point in the video, three desperate Russian soldiers can be seen jumping out of a burning vehicle and running away from it. Scenes like this show why the Javelin is among the most effective tools the US has given Ukraine to beat back Russia, but their usefulness has a lot to do with the issues in Russian combat doctrine. Russian tank tactics, which have not evolved much since the 1990s, involve operating tank columns on their own, without the aid of close infantry support. Usually in modern combined arms warfare, Infantry units support tanks by keeping hunter-killer teams away while putting down covering fire and stopping columns from rolling into ambushes. But because Russia operates its armor independently, Ukrainian troops have been able to use javelins and other ATGMs to wreak havoc on unsuspecting tanks. The next crucial US weapon which has been utilized in Ukraine are several varieties of kamikaze drones. These have become a serious thorn in Putin's side giving him a small taste of his own medicine. First is the Switchblade. The drone's name comes from the way the spring-loaded wings are folded up inside a tube and flipped out once released. Designed and manufactured by California defense company Avex Aerospace, Switchblade drones are light and small enough to fit in a backpack. Launched from a portable two-foot tube, each drone flies to the target area and can loiter, waiting for its target for up to an hour. Once the target approaches, an operator instructs the drone to dive toward enemy personnel and detonate a small grenade-like charge, releasing a shotgun spray of shrapnel in a specific direction. Its loitering nature means that unlike most other weapons, the switchblade can wave off or abort a mission if the situation changes after launch, allowing it to engage a secondary target or destroy itself without inflicting casualties or damage to property. Its small size and extended operation time also make it great for destroying entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles like trucks. Videos like this one, shared on Twitter by open source analyst Abraxas Spa, show Ukrainian operators launching switchblades from city streets before retreating to hidden positions to help guide them. While there are no definitive numbers on targets eliminated with switchblade drones, it seems likely that they have accounted for hundreds of Russian casualties and equipment losses. There are also two varieties of the drone, the 300 and 600 models. The Switchblade 300 was widely used by US troops in Afghanistan against the Taliban, but considered less than ideal for the higher intensity warfare in Ukraine. Most of those given to Ukraine appear to be the 600 model, which is much larger and heavier, but has a longer flight time and larger payload, making it ideal for taking out heavy armor or fortified positions. But US military aid extended beyond the switchblade as well. The Pentagon has also given Ukrainian forces a number of Phoenix Ghost drones. These were also developed by AVEX under the US military's Big Safari weapons program, meant to rapidly acquire and deploy weapons to meet unexpected threats without relying on new research and development. The US has supplied over 1,000 of these killer drones so far, which have proven to be similarly lethal in the hands of Ukrainian operators. While even the larger switchblades are limited to an hour of loitering, the Phoenix Ghost can hover over an area for up to six hours at a time, 
making it a much deadlier surprise weapon. It can also conduct both day and nighttime surveillance thanks to its advanced infrared sensors, but like the switchblade, once a target has been detected and identified, the drone dives downwards and explodes on impact. The primary downside of the Phoenix Ghost drone appears to be its reduced speed, which appears in videos to be roughly half that of the Switchblade 600. Even so, Alexei Arostovich, advisor to the Ukrainian President's office, told reporters last year that 580 of such units equals about 350 destroyed targets in the close rear, indicating a roughly 60% success rate. It's unclear how much this has changed, but it seems likely that US-supplied loitering munitions continue to play a big role in Ukraine's ability to strike behind Russian lines. The latest US aid package to Ukraine from July 2023, containing over $1.3 billion of equipment, also reportedly contains hundreds of new switchblades and Phoenix Ghosts. This is especially important since Kyiv acknowledged in May that its forces are losing about 10,000 drones per month during both intelligence gathering and strike activities. Similarly, military experts have said the relatively large losses of troops and slow advance of Ukrainians' recently launched counteroffensive are due primarily to the dense landmines Russian troops have laid in anticipation. That potentially deadly terrain separating defenders from invading forces will therefore make additional drones capable of inflicting precise attacks on distant targets especially useful. But just why is Russia having so much trouble dealing with these US-made drones? The simple answer is that the country hasn't effectively prepared for modern warfare. Despite its pre-invasion claims that its military could take on even the USA, the fact of the matter is that Russian commanders have proven they have no idea how to wage modern, combined arms warfare. By keeping different elements of their forces isolated and working individually, rather than in coordination, everything from Russian armor to supply lines to infantry troops are far more vulnerable than they should be. There's also the small problem that intelligence gathering among different elements of the Russian military is essentially non-existent. Because different Russian officials are constantly out to get each other and competing for power and influence, they have a strong incentive to let each other's forces take most of the losses to try and preserve their own power. Obviously, this doesn't work very well when you're facing a determined and increasingly well-armed enemy like Ukraine. The astronomical Russian casualties after a year and a half of fighting are proof enough that Western smart munitions like the Switchblade and Phoenix Ghost are more than Putin's commanders can handle. The less obvious answer is that while Russia is especially unprepared, very few militaries today are prepared to effectively counter the threat of loitering aerial munitions. Just about any force on the planet, including the US itself, would be hard-pressed to defend against repeated strikes by kamikaze drones. There's simply no way to provide infantry troops with effective protection from them, especially as anti-aircraft guns can almost never hit every drone launched. The best way to defend against something like the Switchblade or Phoenix Ghost are electronic countermeasures, such as EMP pulses, which can knock out the signal of overhead drones. Even so, Russia simply does not have the capabilities to stop their strikes, making these some of the most effective weapons supplied to Ukraine so far. Another critical piece of military hardware that Russia has struggled against is the Stinger missile system. At the start of the war, large numbers of Russian aircraft were operating over Ukraine's airspace, leading to predictions that they would soon establish air superiority. But this wasn't on the cards either. And one main reason is the FIM-92 Stinger missile and its counterparts from around the world given to Ukraine. First entering service in 1981, the Stinger is a man-portable air defense system, or MANPADS, developed by defense giant Raytheon. Russia first encountered these deadly platforms all the way back in 1985, during its invasion of Afghanistan. Back then, the US supplied the Afghan Mujahideen fighters with Stingers, which they put to remarkable use for the next few years. The Stinger hasn't changed much since then. It can engage a target from nearly two and a half miles away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft and helicopters. The Stinger's missile is 5 feet long and 2.8 inches in diameter. The missile itself weighs 22 pounds, while the missile with its launch tube and integral sight fitted with a grip stock and identification friend or foe IFF antenna weighs approximately 34 pounds. The Stinger uses a smart seeker head able to differentiate between an enemy's exhaust plume and engines helping it home in on even rapidly moving targets. The warhead itself is roughly 2.3 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, 
a deadly mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminium powder. This does not make the Stinger any less effective, however, since its targeting system allows it to strike the vulnerable engines of enemy aircraft. To fire the missile, a BCU battery coolant unit is inserted into the grip stock. This device consists of a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which is injected into the seeker to cryogenically cool it to operating temperature, and a thermal battery which provides power for target acquisition. A single BCU provides power and coolant for roughly 45 seconds after which another must be inserted if the missile has not been fired. Guidance to the target is initially achieved through proportional navigation, but once in flight, switches to another mode, which is what allows the missile to avoid exhaust plumes. The answer to why the Stingers have been so effective against Russia this time around again has a lot to do with terrible military doctrine and planning. Russia has long struggled to integrate its use of air power with ground campaigns, something which Ukrainians have been exploiting for more than a year. Because Russia conducted its air sorties independently of ground advances, Ukraine was able to shoot down huge numbers of its low-flying vehicles with stingers and other manpad systems. This was also not helped by Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its aircraft, especially older models, lack the modern targeting pods found on Western jets, meaning they have to dip low to have any hope of precise strikes on enemy positions. This leaves them extremely vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles like the Stinger, especially when they cannot detect where the missiles are coming from. Next, no video about US weapons would be complete without mention of the HIMARS system. This powerful rocket artillery system is one of the crown jewels of US aid to Ukraine, and in recent months, reports suggest they have become increasingly decisive in determining the direction of the war. HIMARS stands for High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, a variety of the MLRS rockets, which have been in use since the 1990s. The HIMARS are considered most effective for attacking stationary targets such as infrastructure and troops in a concentrated area, but their extremely long range means that they can be used from far behind the front lines. As Ian Williams, Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, has noted, HIMARS is one of the world's most advanced rocket artillery systems. Its range is farther than anything the Ukrainians had, so when that was transferred, they got the ability to strike targets deeper behind the front lines and much more accurately. Other experts largely concur, and many have pointed out that without the use of HIMARS, Ukraine would not have been able to liberate nearly as much territory as it has. HIMARS rockets have been particularly effective in fighting Russia's offensive in Donbass by allowing Ukraine to attack Russian supply and ammunition depots. They were also crucial in forcing Russia to withdraw from Kherson. George Barros, an analyst on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War, concluded that that was only possible because the Ukrainians had this extended strike capability to degrade those bridges. Without the HIMARS, I don't think the Ukrainians would have liberated Kherson. And while it's certainly powerful, the HIMARS does not have either the range or payload of its cousin, the M270 MLRS. But what it lacks in range and firepower, the HIMARS more than makes up for in maneuverability. Its concept came about at the end of the Cold War, when it became apparent that the US military would be fighting more low-intensity conflicts in multiple environments. This led the Pentagon to move away from clunky, traditional rocket artillery and towards systems with a lighter footprint. It's this speed and maneuverability which has made the HIMARS so important for Ukraine's war effort. Faced with Russia's overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform able to rapidly deliver a payload and depart before it could be targeted with enemy counter-battery fire or airstrikes. Traditional artillery would most likely have been blown to bits before it could be moved, have let them launch numerous strikes without substantial retaliation, and once a HIMARS is fired, it usually finds its target. Each of its six GLMRS rockets has a range of 57 miles and is armed with a high-precision warhead. This means it can fire from well outside the range of traditional artillery and still hit its targets within several meters of accuracy. This has enabled Ukraine to strike at highly entrenched Russian positions, targeting their weakest points. HIMARS rockets can also each be set to independent targets, or used for repeated strikes on the same area of a fortification. Since Ukraine received its HIMARS, it has used them to take out everything from ammunition depots to command and control centers, managing to slow Russian advances to a crawl. Yet despite devoting large amounts of air power to taking out the missiles, Russia has apparently failed to touch 90% of them, instead losing more and more aircraft to stingers every time it's tried. 
Part of the reason for this is that in addition to utilizing the HIMARS mobility, Ukraine also created multiple dummies, consisting of a generic heavy-duty truck frame, painted green and made to look as though it's carrying missiles. Ukraine has also apparently gotten so good at using HIMARS that it has actually been able to take out stalled tank columns, despite the system's intended use against stationary targets. As of last month, the US has supplied 38 HIMARS to Ukraine, but soon it may need more. Former Ukrainian Marine and captured British fighter Aidan Aslin recently told Newsweek that Russia appears to be hoarding its battlefield resources further away out of HIMARS range. This suggests that the country will soon need more weapons with even greater reach, such as ATAC-Ms or British Storm Shadow missiles. But experts also say the real advantage of sending different long-range missiles lies not in their individual capabilities, but in the numbers. The more missiles Kyiv can get its hands on, the more chances they have to strike Russian targets and the more damage they can do. All of this suggests that while the war shows no signs of stopping soon, Russia remains unable to deal with the superior firepower the US has provided Ukraine. It's not likely to get any better anytime soon either, as Russia continues to run out of resources and trained personnel. But what do you think? Will more US weapons ultimately be what ends the war? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Is Ukraine slowly cooking up a pot of Putin's ultimate defeat? There's a popular metaphor which compares a frog to a leader or an organization. As the story goes, if a frog is thrown into a pot of boiling water, it will immediately sense danger and leap to safety. However, throw the same frog in a pot of lukewarm water and increase the temperature one degree at a time, and it won't sense danger until it's too late. The meaning is clear. Unless individuals and organizations exercise constant vigilance and adapt to changing circumstances, they can lead themselves into a proverbial pot of hot water, irreversible danger with terrifying consequences. Some experts believe this metaphor applies equally to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Last year, after easily overrunning cities like Kharkiv and Kherson, Putin's forces perhaps thought it would be easy to continue the offensive and consolidate their gains. Their failure to topple Zelensky's regime and serious and recurring logistical problems opened a window of opportunity for Ukraine to seize the initiative. This they did, gradually applying offensive pressure on all fronts, and here is where they began to increase the operational tempo, fainting one way, then boldly attacking another until the operational waters reached their boiling point. Russian troops quickly discovered their positions were untenable, they weren't prepared for the breakthrough in Kharkiv, or the more measured collapse of their hold on Kherson until it was too late. Like a frog unable to perceive the slowly but steadily rising temperatures of the water it found itself immersed in, Putin's strategy to wait and see founded during those dual debacles, in sore need of new conscripts, the frontline troops he did have were effectively boiled in the crucible of war, some proverbially, others, well, literally. Their positions were impossible to sustain, and consequently, they were left with little recourse but to withdraw. Now that the war's front lines have by and large stagnated, some say Ukraine is subtly attempting to bring the water to a boil in other strategic areas. While most observers freely admit Ukraine's 2023 counteroffensive has fallen short of its intended objectives, could a boil the frog strategy still be in play in places like, say, Crimea? Join us today as we explore this issue. Military organizations, more than perhaps any other, are incentivized to adapt to the changing conditions. Their very survival depends on it. Even those as demonstrably inept as Russia's have shown, from time to time, some measured capacity for adaptability over the past year. Putin's forces seem to have wised up after their embarrassing setbacks at Kharkiv and Kherson. Ukraine's relatively unknown offensive capabilities were put on full display, and as Russia's own offensive might have culminated in a series of multi-pronged yet misguided ventures, it opted to consolidate and defend the cities it had captured rather than extend its neck deeper into the Ukrainian vice. This resulted in the strategic decision to sit back and create a defensive network it could viably hold in the event of the anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive. And to their credit, the defensive networks they constructed were said to rival some of those found during World War I, more than a century prior. But Russia has not forsaken offensive operations altogether. More recently, We've watched as Russia has started the slow transition from defensive to offensive operations of their own, a half year after their somewhat pyrrhic victory at Bakhmut in May 2023. Looking back on that attritional struggle, 
It's strange to contemplate why Russia placed so much strategic value on a city as devastated as it was. In the end, entirely bereft of infrastructure, resources, and political influence. Sure, Prigozhin got his day in the sun, but like Icarus, perhaps in the end, he flew too close. In some sense, the immense bloodletting in Bakhmut played into Ukrainian hands. While they prepared their forces to strike on the southern axis, they opted to remain on the defensive for much of the Bakhmut battle. Letting Putin press more and more forces into the crucible there deprived him of stronger defenses elsewhere. Like hanging a carrot in front of a donkey, the Ukrainians gambled away Bakhmut in the hope Putin's wagon, firmly tied onto a strategically bankrupt position, would spread Russian troops across a wider frontage and thus create the conditions for success elsewhere. It was a decision in line with the past successes, a bait-and-switch not unlike the priming operations preceding the Kharkiv and Kherson victories. We now know this gamble didn't entirely pay off. Penetrating prepared defenses without air superiority is inarguably the most difficult operation Ukraine could have undertaken, barring, say, a full-blown amphibious assault across the Dnipro River. Yet, mounting domestic and international pressure gave the AFU little other option but to go for it, and their counter-offensive, inching forward yard by yard, has suffered, though not failed, in the bitter cauldron awaiting them. Russia might be able to relate now that they've had a chance to both hold on to Bakhmut and stage new offensives of their own in Avdivka of late. Avdivka comparatively holds far more significance than Bakhmut, owing to its proximity to Donetsk. For more than a month, Russia went pedal to the metal there, committing something like eight brigades, with complements of armor, trucks, and mechanized vehicles, and sustained some of the heaviest casualties of the year, according to British intelligence agencies. When you consider how many Russians were killed in Bakhmut and Fuladar earlier this year, that observation is startling. When you consider how far they actually managed to get in Avdivka, that is to say, not far at all, it becomes even more significant. Like it has from the beginning, personnel issues have been Russia's Achilles heel, not necessarily in quantity, where there seems to be an endless stream of contract soldiers and conscripts being flung into battle, but in quality. According to one Russian blogger, an expert on operations in the Donbass, who writes under the pseudonym Wayne Howell, the recent recruitment of contract soldiers from underprivileged social groups pales in comparison to the caliber of professionals and enthusiasts enlisted at the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Howell cites several startling anecdotes to illustrate just how stark the golfing quality has become over the past two years. There is excessive drinking among new recruits, something he claims regularly leads to their deaths and serious injuries. Examples include fatal instances where a Ural off-road vehicle was driven off a cliff, a soldier fell from a tank and was crushed beneath the tracks of an infantry fighting vehicle, or a recruit sustained a severed arm while playing with an RPG. Rampant alcoholism and an endemic lack of discipline have forced Russian officers into dire straits to maintain order and control. Many, according to Howell, resort to physical punishment, violence, and threats of execution. There are other metrics of quality available to intelligence analysts. You have, for example, men like Nikolai Ogolobyak, a convicted Satanist involved in ritual murders of four teenagers in 2010, who was pardoned after only six months on the front line. Another recruit, Denis Gorin, who was serving a light 22-year sentence for, I kid you not, murder and cannibalism, was recently wounded and will more than likely be released upon recovery. No wonder we see Russian soldiers regularly abandon wounded comrades-in-arms in their time of need. All of this comes, predictably, with a severe downtick in motivation, which, in turn, results in a market inability to achieve noticeable results on the front line. We've seen a return to Wagner tactics, recruit the worst of the worst, amalgamate them into Storm Z units, and throw them in waves at the nearest hellhole. This lack of professionalism, Howell and other experts claim, is what's preventing Russian forces from eliminating the Ukrainian foothold on the Kherson axis. Despite continuous airstrikes for two weeks and the deployment of additional naval infantry units, Ukraine continues to creep toward the M14 Belt Highway, a lifeline of Russian supply to Novokokovka. If they cut it off, the Russian situation there may grow even more untenable. The water temperature is rising, degree by degree. But back in Avdivka, you might say, Russians did manage to enter the industrial zone, didn't they? Yes, but only at the cost of a third wave of assaults, resulting in significant military losses without yielding substantial gains. So here we are. Russia is raging against the machine, 
wading through minefields and mud, the offensive potential of the AFU is likewise mostly depleted, and it has real resource constraints to deal with over the winter. The tempo of frontline operations has slowed dramatically. Advances are now measured in hundreds of meters at best, and contested territories regularly change hands. Most fighting occurs at the platoon and assault group level, involving only a few soldiers rather than entire battalions. Soldiers mostly remain in trenches, and according to one commentator, achieving any substantial gains with such small groups of men is virtually impossible. Where does that leave Russia? They will continue to try and encircle Avdivka, but with the shadow of Bakhmut looming over the battlefield, there is no guarantee even if they capture it, they'll be able to hold it. As at Bakhmut, Ukraine will not go gently into that good night. They will thrash and flail and rail and defend with all their might and likely, in the process, not only inflict thousands more Russian casualties, but keep them tidily localized in the east. Where does that leave Ukraine? Truthfully, a prolonged defense of Avdivka counterintuitively works in their favor if their ultimate military strategy remains focused on someday recapturing Crimea. The only way they can actually achieve this is if they manage to isolate and cut the land bridge it enjoys with Russia. According to Ed Arnold, a research fellow at Britain's Royal United Services Institute and ex-infantry officer, Ukraine now knows how Russia fights and have learned how to manage Russian offensive operations and mitigate their threat while undergoing the requisite period of regeneration. Notably, Arnold believes it's premature to claim Ukraine's counteroffensive has both come to an end or resulted in failure. One of the issues, he said in an interview, is that we try to measure success on the expectations which are far too high anyway. Actually, it's less about the whole territory that's been liberated over the last five months, and it's more about where it is. They are pressing towards Tokmak, a crossroads on the road to the Sea of Azov. They are making limited river crossings over the Dnipro River, straining the Russian flank. And so, if they continue edging towards this critical overland supply passage while Russia commits massive formations in places like Avdivka, you introduce the possibility of isolating Crimea. Russia will be forced to fill gaps rather than having time to reconstitute defensive lines. And when you factor in what's been going on in the Black Sea, operations integral to Ukraine's military strategy but whose impact is rarely visible on the map, where persistent drone attacks have forced Russian ships to virtually leave Sevastopol and stage further afield from the battlefield, what the UK Defence Minister recently labelled the functional defeat of the Black Sea Fleet has made the pot just another degree hotter for the Russian frog. In the long run, we may look back on the 2023 Ukrainian counteroffensive in far different terms than many commentators are bandying about today. Not a disappointing anticlimax, but a vital preparatory phase to the very difficult task before them in 2024. In Ukraine's boiling the frog strategy, the jewel is Crimea. It is Putin's darling, but rather than assaulting it militarily, which would more than likely result in an unthinkable military disaster, Ukraine may be able to incrementally increase pressure by layering its ongoing operations, full-front engagement, intelligence penetration, partisan warfare, drone attacks, depriving the Black Sea Fleet any room for maneuver, the occasional drone strike on Russia itself, these all limit options Putin enjoys and eventually could make it simply untenable to retain its hold on Crimea, similar to the way Russia's presence in Afghanistan eventually became untenable. Ukraine's access to Western munitions and materiel will weigh heavily in the final outcome of this struggle. The provision of long-range missile systems like the Atakams have already proven to be devastatingly effective. For several weeks, a spate of reports revealed a series of highly destructive strikes carried out against Russian targets, forcing Putin's senior military officials to wrestle with the question of balancing the need to withdraw certain priority targets beyond the reach of Atakam's missiles, while continuing to provide the necessary support for forces engaged in bitter fighting along the front lines of the war. Unlike weapon systems like the Paladin, HIMARS, cluster munitions, or the F-16 M1 Abrams or M2 Bradley, Atakams were sent to Ukraine without much fanfare or announcement. Ukraine benefited from this decision, using the element of surprise to mount overnight attacks on Russian airbases in mid-October 2023, to devastating effect. Russia now knows the impact of these missile systems. Ukraine knows it must continue to nurture its pipeline of long-range munitions for the short and distant future. Underpinning it all is the outsized impact of these extended-range weapons in Ukrainian hands. It affects the immediate tactical calculus of Russian officers who, left with no real answer, 
had to virtually push their highest value targets further and further back from the front lines, under the threat of HIMARS, and now even further with ATACOMS. Strategically, Ukraine will have to make a conscious decision to expend its precious supply of these munitions throughout the winter in order to degrade logistics hubs, trench digging equipment, ammunition dumps, and command and control nodes that will be vital in defending the path to Crimea. There is an even longer range and more persistent threat Russia must contend with, partisan warfare, and special operations in Russian-controlled territory. Ukraine's intelligence network is incredibly capable and has a deep bench of contacts both within and without the Russian Federation. These networks have occasionally made their presence known throughout the conflict, targeted assassinations of pro-Russian occupation officials, car bombings, drone strikes, and cross-border incursions into Russia itself, and even recent reports of Ukrainian Special Forces units masterminding drone strikes on Wagner PMC units operating in Sudan. These attacks send a clear message. Ukraine can strike anywhere, everywhere, and without prejudice, if it has to. It's another part of the layered approach at the heart of Ukraine's boil the frog strategy, another gradually compounding factor which will make holding areas like Crimea more and more difficult as time goes by. Eventually, Putin will be left with two choices. Withdraw from eastern Ukraine and eventually Crimea itself, a very unlikely outcome, or reinforce his present positions even more than he already has. Crimea's vulnerabilities are well known to the Ukrainians. They are just waiting for the right opportunity and delivery system to put another munition on the Kerch Bridge mounting the pressure to force Putin to reinforce the region at the expense of other fronts. This is why the Tokmak Axis was Ukraine's major axis of attack. Control the railways there, and you can virtually control the movements in and out of Crimea. In this case, it's not even vital that they reach the Sea of Azov itself for this strategy to achieve its intended effect. It just has to imperil Russia's lateral lines of communication to the extent that its position in southeastern Ukraine becomes untenable and leaves Crimea more vulnerable to layered attacks. If Putin is indeed playing the long game, there's a lot he'll have to consider. Yes, Russia has far more territory than it did in 2014, but holding on to that territory so ineffectively, in a way that has fully telegraphed its true military potential to the entire world, has come at a high cost. Everyone, Russia included, knows it will not be able to stage amphibious offensive operations on the scale it did in 2022 again, for several years minimum. Blunted in Bakhmut, bloodied in Avdivka, if Russia continues to harbor the frankly insane offensive ambitions that it has in 2023, it will only become more and more difficult to hold on to territory it has gained. There have been intonations in certain Russian camps that several senior officials favor some sort of ceasefire. As conditions have stalemated, Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko has also called for a ceasefire, though his opinion isn't worth much in Kremlin circles. Recently, he pointed out how there are enough problems on both sides and, in general, the situation is now seriously stalemated. No one can do anything to substantively strengthen or advance their position. Notably, this was actually the first time he'd stepped out and sought a truce to end the conflict. Zelensky has put forward a 10-point plan and there have, to date, been three rounds of peace talks with both sides and representatives from across the globe putting out feelers as to the feasibility of making it work in theory. In practice, Zelensky has shown zero indications he believes Russia will legitimately adhere to any form of peace accords they agree on. The Russian Federation has no international legitimacy in keeping its word. Until they change, the fighting continues. Both leaders are watching the outcome of the looming US presidential election with a sense of uncertain foreboding. On its outcome rests the future of American material assistance to Ukraine, the posture of the West's foremost member toward Russia as a member of the liberal international order, and, if Trump is re-elected, perhaps Putin's best chance of reaching terms amenable to him while holding onto territory he has captured. Noted British historian and Russian expert Mark Galliotti has recently claimed that for both sides, Crimea will serve as the major bargaining chip on the peace table. From before 2014, Everything, including the Russian occupation of Luhansk and Donetsk, has evolved around Crimea. Putin has stated unequivocally that Crimea is a major red line and that any immediate threat to it will result in a major escalation. Figuring out how to threaten Crimea in the most effective manner possible will continue to occupy Ukrainian military planners. Geographically, it is a formidable target, rimmed by the sea, 
marshy and difficult to traverse in the north, and relatively narrow in terms of land frontage for an amphibious assault in the south, all virtually make direct assaults out of the question. That leaves the boil the frog strategy. Gradual pressure on many fronts not only isolates the region, but removes the immediate escalatory potential of Putin's imaginary red line. Ukraine will likely also have to figure out how to bring synergistic systems like the Atakams, F-16s, and its surviving Western armor to bear. What is reassuring is that Ukraine's layered approach has had a tangible impact on Russia's operational outlay. It has had to bring so many of its vaunted S-400 air defense systems forward to protect high-value targets that it has left Moscow and many parts of Russia almost entirely deprived of air defenses of their own. Scarcity, both of military systems and equipment, is evident on every hand. Political pressure is also mounting, far more demonstrably, in 2023 than it was in 22. Ukraine enjoys the same advantages of other underdogs throughout history, that is, for the foreseeable future, it doesn't have to necessarily deliver a war-winning blow or destroy the entirety of the Russian armed forces on the battlefield, it just has to not lose. Many will try to tell you the conditions are the same for Russia, but don't be fooled. It was the invader, it remains the occupier. Much like the pottery barn analogy thrown about in the wake of the United States 2003 invasion of Iraq, you break it, you buy it. The history of military interventions in hostile territory bear witness to the fact an invader must balance economic support, industrial production, political vitality, and military initiative regardless of the extent of enemy resistance. In each of these, Russia is increasingly found wanting. More importantly, at the strategic level, the corollary to not losing for Ukraine is to continue doing what it's already doing, raising the temperature of the proverbial pot of water one degree at a time until the Russian frog is boiled. But what do you think? Will Ukraine's tactic be successful, or will Putin once again find a way to wiggle his way out of a sticky situation? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Poland is becoming an intimidating military force in Europe, and it's making Putin sweat. A lot. And with good reason. Here's the situation. The balance of power in Eastern Europe is changing rapidly. Russia, the traditional leader in the region, is in decline. Poland, on the other hand, is rapidly gaining strength. In 2023, it is at its strongest standing in the European balance of power since the days of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 17th century, and is currently engaged in a large military buildup that would see it create the strongest fighting force on the continent. For Russia, this poses even more problems than those it has already dealt with in its weakening geopolitical standing. A strong Poland all but guarantees to put a hard limit on Russia's geopolitical ambitions in Eastern Europe and the Baltic Sea. Might we be seeing the beginnings of a purported Thucydides trap scenario in Eastern Europe, where a rising Poland causes fear in the Russian leadership about potentially being displaced as the ruling power in the region? If war did break out, would the Russian military be able to conquer Poland on its own? Let's take a look at the balance of power in Eastern Europe and the Baltic, and how well Russia would do against a much better armed Poland. Poland and Russia have a long history of warfare with each prevailing over the other on numerous occasions. After the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union, Poland went on a spree of breakneck economic growth and joined NATO in 1999. Starting in 2014, Poland began a military buildup. The country had previously been under the NATO guidance of spending 2% of GDP on defense, but in 2022, it spent 2.6% on its military, by NATO estimates. It is increasing its defense spending too, in 2023, it structured its national budget to spend 4% of GDP on its military, making it one of the biggest defense spenders in NATO per capita. Poland can afford this. It has been Europe's biggest economic success story of the 21st century, with an average annual GDP growth rate of almost 4% since the end of the Cold War in 1991. In a generation, Poland has gone from an impoverished communist vassal state to a budding great power. That Poland would increase its defense spending and military ambitions since 2014 is no coincidence. It was the year when Russia intervened in the Ukrainian Maidan unrest, illegally annexed Crimea, and carved separatist territories away from Kyiv's control in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. The Poles, who have a long historical memory, understood what Russia was up to and prepared for a potential confrontation. As a result, the Polish military is now far more capable than it was even a few years ago. 
In the recent past, Poland has been using Soviet-era equipment that the Russian military also uses and is accustomed to dealing with. Such equipment includes tanks like the T-72 main battle tank and the fourth-generation MiG-29 fighter jet. However, Poland is now slowly but steadily getting rid of this equipment, often through donations to the Ukrainian military. It is instead acquiring and training its soldiers to use modern equipment, especially from the United States and South Korea. This new equipment includes an initial order of 32 fifth-generation F-35 Lightning II fighter jets to be delivered between now and 2030. Poland has also ordered 48 South Korean F-A-50 light combat aircraft, which can operate in air-to-air -air or air-to-ground scenarios, and is ideal for helping transition Polish pilots to the F-35. For closer air support, Poland has purchased 96 American AH-64E Apache attack helicopters. Meanwhile, to defend its skies, Poland is purchasing $5 billion worth of American Patriot air defense missiles and $2.4 billion worth of British CAM air defense missiles. Poland's investment in creating a modern air force and air defense system would pose the first big problem for Russia in any renewed Russo-Polish hostilities. Russia has been unable to establish air superiority in Ukraine, and Ukraine had a much less capable air force and air defense network than the ones Poland is now acquiring. Military experts expect that Russia will have about two dozen of its newest fighter jet, the fifth-generation Su-57 Felon, in service by the start of 2024. In 2019, Putin announced plans to have a fleet of 76 of these planes in the Russian Air Force's fleet by 2028. However, international sanctions placed on Russia for its invasion of Ukraine threaten those plans because it is now much more difficult for the Russians to acquire the high-tech components needed for their construction. The existing Su-57s have seen service in Ukraine, but British intelligence reported that such service has been limited because Russian officers fear losing these planes in operations. For an operation against Poland, the Su-57 would come in direct combat with the F-35 in the first ever encounter between two fifth-generation fighter jets. The Su-57 is faster, with a top speed of about 1,500 miles per hour, compared to the F-35's 1,200. It also has a longer range, with a combat radius of 930 miles, compared to the F-35's 590. The Su-57 is designed to be more maneuverable than the F-35, thanks to its forward-swept wing design. However, the F-35 is harder to detect by radar. The biggest advantage that Polish pilots would have over the Su-57 is the number of planes that they have. Because of sanctions, development of additional Su-57s for Russia may prove impossible, while Poland can continue to expect more F-35s in its air fleet. The longer Russia waits, the more its disparity is likely to grow. The Russian air fleet is much bigger than Poland's as a whole, with 4,036 aircraft between its army and navy as of 2023. In comparison, the Polish Air Force has only 275 planes in service. In an all-out assault, Russia should theoretically be able to overwhelm the Poles through numbers, but the fact that it could not do this in Ukraine raises questions about whether the Russians would be able to establish air superiority against a more capable force, and with time, the number and ability of Poland's aircraft will grow in comparison to Russia. The same principle also applies on land. Poland is in the process of creating a vast army. It has plans to nearly double the size of its army to 300,000 active duty personnel by 2030, which would make it the largest fighting force in Europe. The Polish public supports this move. Enlistments in the Polish military have spiked since Russia invaded Ukraine. As of 2023, the Polish army has about 189,000 total personnel. The Russian army is much bigger, with 3.6 million total personnel. Whether now or in 2030, the Poles would be significantly outnumbered in a Russian invasion. Experts believe that between 100,000 and 200,000 Russian troops are stationed in the Baltic enclave of Kaliningrad, which is also home to Russia's Baltic fleet and hosts nuclear weapons. The presence of Kaliningrad poses serious geostrategic problems for Poland. The heavily fortified enclave is only 240 miles north of Warsaw. Kaliningrad also sits a mere 40 miles away from Belarus's western border. This stretch of territory is called the Suwalki Gap, and military experts consider it the most vulnerable position in NATO's territory. A Russian offensive westward from Belarus and eastward from Kaliningrad across the Suwalki Gap would, if successful, cut Poland off from its NATO allies Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. While those three Baltic states would suffer the worst for it, a successful operation across the Suwalki Gap 
would deprive Poland of some supplies and military options. Meanwhile, a drive southward from Kaliningrad toward Warsaw would force Poland into a defensive operation to protect its capital. Numerically superior Russian forces would also be far more heavily concentrated in a Polish campaign than they had been in Ukraine, which is much vaster territory. The dispersal of Russian forces across such a large area was one of the reasons why the Russian advance at the start of the war did not come as rapidly as outside observers originally predicted. Poland, with its more compact size, would not have the same luxury. Most of the fighting would take place along the narrower axis between Kaliningrad and the Belarusian border. Belarus's cooperation would be needed in these operations, but for all intents and purposes, it is a Russian vassal buffer state, and leaked Russian documents from early 2023 suggest that Moscow aims to annex Belarus by 2030. While Belarus did not intervene directly in the war in Ukraine, it hosted troops that attacked Kyiv, and it currently hosts over 9,000 Russian troops. With plans to build even bigger bases, Belarus would be forced to host Russian troops for an invasion of Poland if the Kremlin really wanted to undertake the operation. Poland therefore has significant geographical vulnerabilities that would aid the attack from Russian forces which outnumber them. Theoretically, this should mean that Russia can take very heavy casualties in a drive on Warsaw from north and east and still win. One Ukrainian soldier fighting against the Russians in Donbass in March 2023 said the following, The Russian mobilizational reserve is pretty much infinite, which means that they have the luxury to make mistakes. They can lose a brigade, or they can lose a platoon, and some of those people are going to survive, and they can share experience with the new conscripts. If Russia were to bring its full national might into the war effort, with different waves of mobilization, the Poles' numerical disadvantage would become more pronounced. Poland's population according to its 2022 census is about 38 million, Russia's is about 147 million. However, as we've seen in Ukraine, the total number of personnel in the military does not equally translate to combat power on the battlefield. Russia's logistical problems were apparent from the earliest days of the war in Ukraine, when it was operating on the border of its own territory. Russian logistics for a war against Poland would be even more stretched. The supply lines would be longer, as they would need to go from the vast Russian interior, concentrate in Belarus, and then make their way to Poland. Waterborne supply lines from St. Petersburg to Kaliningrad would be shorter, but the balance of power in the Baltic currently greatly disfavors Russia. The Baltic, for all practical purposes, has become a NATO lake, especially with Finland's entry into the alliance and Sweden's entry pending. These maritime supply lines would be quickly disrupted in the event of a Russian war with Poland, even in the extremely unlikely scenario that NATO does not honor Article 5 commitments. Russian forces operating from Kaliningrad would therefore be difficult to supply unless the Russian offensive can create a land bridge from there to Belarus. Such a scenario would give Poland the opportunity to concentrate vital resources to prevent the Russians from achieving their objective. Destroying Russian supply lines and command and control centers would slow the advance down and give Poland more time to mobilize and counterattack. Fortunately for Poland, there are weapons on hand which would help in this strategy. Undoubtedly, military officials in Warsaw had it in mind when embarking on their arms buildup. As of March 2023, Poland has purchased 18 HIMARS rocket artillery systems from the United States. Poland plans to increase the number of HIMARS in its arsenal to 500 units. Ukraine has used HIMARS to devastating effect against Russian forces. HIMARS is a highly precise delivery system, and attacks on key assets like ammunition and fuel depots, command and control stations, and other supply routes crippled Russian positions and allowed the Ukrainians to retake vast swathes of territory in the late summer and autumn of 2022. HIMARS can come with a magazine of six MLRS rockets, most notably the M31 GMLRS Unitary, which can hit targets up to 70 kilometers away. Poland's HIMARS, however, will be even more capable because the Poles have made an initial order of 45 ATAC M's missiles. These munitions have a range of 300 kilometers and would offer the Poles excellent options in striking critical Russian targets. Presumably, staging points in Kaliningrad and Belarus would be a high priority for Poland's HIMARS systems and ATAC M's missiles, especially since the enclave would be difficult to resupply by sea. ATAC M's can reach that far, and Poland would not hesitate to use its missiles in this way. The damage Ukraine did to Russia with only a few dozen HIMARS systems and without ATAC M's missiles would pale in comparison with what the Poles could do with many more such systems and the longer-range ammunition. 
poorly organized and supplied Russian forces, which would need to operate further from their own territory to begin with, would prove ripe targets for a hail of HIMARS fire. And HIMARS is not the only modern rocket artillery system that Poland is getting its hands on. To supplement HIMARS, Poland is purchasing the South Korean K239 Chunmu MLRS platform. The first batch of 18 of these arrived in Poland in 2023, and the Poles plan to increase the size of the force to 288. The Chunmu, which was designed to counter long-range North Korean artillery, can fire several types of unguided rockets, with ranges between 30 and 45 kilometers, guided rockets that can hit targets 80 kilometers away, and a ballistic missile capable of strikes up to 290 kilometers. The Chunmu launchers would put further pressure on Russian supply lines and communications. In Ukraine, the Russians have adapted to HIMARS by placing their critical assets further behind the front lines. They would try to do this in a Polish campaign too, but Poland will have longer-range weapons between ATAC-Ms and the Chunmu launched missiles. Additionally, Russian supply lines will be longer, with less room for dispersal of critical assets because of the more compact front that would come from a military confrontation between Poland and Russia. This is where Russia's numbers might wind up working against it, as more troops would be concentrated and vulnerable to rocket and missile attacks. The Russians have also shown poor signal security in Ukraine, which led to many HIMARS attacks on important targets. The Russian military has a poor command structure and doctrine, with centralized control that discourages initiative in junior officers and aggregates decision-making to commanders further from the front. MLRS attacks on supply lines and communication hubs would therefore slow the Russian advance into Poland considerably, with confused masses of Russian officers being unsure about how to act when not in communication with their superiors. In contrast, Poland's command structure should be far more nimble and adaptive thanks to superior NATO doctrine, and better protected against the problems that come from a top-heavy organizational structure. Heavy rocket and missile attacks against Russian forces trying to establish a land bridge from Belarus to Kaliningrad would probably prove effective in slowing the Russian advance, raising Polish morale and causing chaos in the Russian command. Poland is also investing heavily in modern tanks to further bolster its ground fighting capability. 250 M1A2 Abrams, 116 M1A1 Abrams and 1,000 South Korean K2 main battle tanks are on the way while the Poles are slowly but surely shedding their stockpile of older Soviet-era tanks like the T-72. The Poles are often donating this equipment to the Ukrainians. Meanwhile, Poland's current arsenal also has more than 240 Leopard tanks, which would find themselves comfortable among the modern American and South Korean tanks set to arrive. Poland also plans on having a fleet of 1,000 of its native Borsuk infantry fighting vehicles, which are being designed to work alongside the incoming K2 tanks. In total, the Poles' armoured forces will dwarf anything else in Europe. For a country that has long prided itself on its armoured forces, the Russian tank units have done poorly in Ukraine. Almost 2,000 tanks have been destroyed or abandoned there. Russia has also been hesitant to deploy its supposed latest and greatest tank, the T-14 Armata, in Ukraine. In early September 2023, it withdrew the few Armatas there, after supposed successful tests. The Russians might not have any choice but to be less hesitant with the Armata in a hostile encounter with Poland. Unfortunately for Russia, there are only a small number of Armatas in service. A test batch of about 40 was available in 2021, far short of the 2,300 the Kremlin said it would have by now. Such claims were made a decade ago. Even if the tanks are as good as the Russians say, and there is good reason to believe that they are not, there are too few Armatas to affect the course of a conflict and with Western sanctions in place for the long haul, it's unlikely that Russia will be able to build up enough of the tanks to give it an advantage over the modern tanks Poland is acquiring. The Russian tank force still dwarfs the size of Poland's in sheer numbers. Russia fields significantly more tanks than any other country, up to about 12,600. However, only about 2,600 of those are main battle tanks, and only about a quarter of those 2,600 are the T-72 B3 B3M, T-80 BVM and T-90 AM tanks that have modern fire control and sighting systems. Additionally, those are 2021 figures. Russia has lost many of its best armored assets in Ukraine since then. These tanks will be difficult for Russia to replace thanks to sanctions. Russia can break its archaic tanks out of storage, as it has been doing in Ukraine, but these would be cannon fodder for armored wave attacks to overwhelm the Poles through sheer numbers. On a narrow front, those numbers matter even though the Russians would take terrible casualties. 
Russia's ace in the hole may be its preponderance in artillery. The Russian army has always traditionally been an artillery-centered fighting force. The Russian Artillery Corps has about 6,000 gun and rocket systems as of 2023. Poland is modernizing its gun systems with plans to purchase 600 South Korean K9A1 self-propelled howitzers that can hit targets 34 miles away. Russia would have more artillery than Poland in any scenario, but despite what they report about their artillery having one of the world's best fire control systems, Russian gunners are often poorly trained, inaccurate, and following bad doctrine. The result is many wasted shots. This is why despite their firepower advantage, the Russians have suffered many reverses in Ukraine and have been unable to translate their artillery superiority into decisive victories. There is no reason to believe it would be different in Poland. The narrower front might mean greater luck for Russian artillery, but Polish gunners would almost certainly be more accurate shot for shot than their Russian opponents. In a war on Polish territory, Russia would have a numerical superiority in the air and on land. With enough dedication, the Russians could try to overwhelm the Poles with its sheer mass of personnel and firepower, but this would be a costly strategy, reminiscent of the Winter War of 1939-1940, where the Red Army's wave attacks resulted in it suffering as many as 10 times the amount of casualties Finland took. The rapid modernization of Poland's military, Russia's long supply lines and logistic problems, and poor doctrine and command structure mean that something similar could happen in a renewed Russo-Polish war. This would be the most probable scenario. Russia may win if it puts its full effort behind the invasion, but its ability to project further power would become crippled in the process. Or perhaps Russia's logistics and command would be so weak and Poland's forces so much more effective that Russia gets stopped in its tracks as it did around Kyiv, when its supply lines were inadequate even though the distances involved were much shorter than would be the case in a Polish campaign. But what do you think? What would a war between Russia and Poland look like? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button and be sure to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.